Mysterious Traveler. This is the Mysterious Traveler, inviting you to join me on another journey into the realm of the strange and the terrifying. I hope you will enjoy the trip, that it will thrill you a little and uh, chill you a little. So settle back and get a good grip on your nerves, if you can. Where are we going? Why, today we're going to accompany Mr. Harvey Benson through a fateful 24 hours of his life. In a story I call... No One on the Line. Our visit with Harvey Benson begins on a Wednesday evening in summer. Harvey, a self-made businessman, is smoking a cigar and reading the paper while his wife, Linda, reads a book. It's really quite a picture of peaceful domesticity. <coughs> well, that's that. Nothing much in the paper tonight, dear. It's too bad your poker game tonight fell through, darling. I know how you look forward to Wednesday evening. Oh, well, it doesn't matter. Good book you're reading? Oh, yes. Yes, it's very exciting. It's a new murder mystery everybody's talking about. I would have guessed it was rather dull from the way you've been looking at the same page for ten minutes now. Oh, was I? I must have been wool gathering. Well, I guess I'll go... Oh, phone. I'll get it, Linda. No, sit still, Harvey. You're tired. I'll answer. No, I insist, my dear. <coughs> Hello. 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 That's funny. No one on the line. Well, how strange. Maybe the phone's out of order. No, I heard the click as someone hung up when I answered. Oh, but it's not worth wondering about. It's getting late. What do you say we turn in? And now we join Harvey again at breakfast the following morning. It's getting late, but Harvey lingers over his coffee as if he had the whole day ahead of him. Mmm. Good coffee, this. Pour me some more, will you, darling? Of course, Harvey. But, uh, shouldn't you be leaving for your office, dear? Oh, there's plenty of time. But it's almost 9.30. You seem very anxious to get me to the office, Linda. You're not trying to get rid of me by any chance. Oh, well, of course not. But you said you had an important appointment this morning, oh, and yes, I just thought... Oh, yes, but the fellow will wait. Mmm, my good coffee, this. Harvey. Hmm? Is there anything wrong? Anything wrong? Yes. You seemed a little odd the last day or two, and this morning... And what's the matter with me this morning? Oh, I don't know that anything is, but you do seem a little strange. Strange? In what way, Linda, my dear? Oh, I'm sorry if I've said anything to annoy you, but... Oh, I'll answer it. Still, Linda, I'll answer it. But, Harvey, it's probably... I said I'll answer it. Maybe a call I've been expecting. All right, Harvey. Hello? 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 Strange, there's no one on the line. Same thing that happened last night. Well, how peculiar. Oh, but that phone must be out of order. Yes, I suppose so. And yet I could swear I heard someone hang up when I answered. Oh, you must have been mistaken, darling. I suppose so. You better give the company a ring, Linda. Yes, I will, Harvey, right away. Good, and now I do have to be going. Uh, see you tonight, darling. So now we accompany Harvey Benson to his office. Uh, because we're spending one complete day with him, remember? His office is large and luxurious, reflecting the success Harvey Benson has achieved in the world by hard work and constant vigilance. Once arrived there, Harvey plunges into his work. Until shortly before noon, the sound of the inter-office phone arouses him. Excuse me, Mr. Benson. Oh, uh, yes, Miss Johnson? Uh, Mr. Mungo is here to see you. Shall I send him in? No, ask him to wait. I'd like to see you for a moment first, Miss Johnson. Certainly, Mr. Benson. I'll be right in. Yes, Mr. Benson? Uh, sit down, please, Miss Johnson. Yes, sir. I've brought my book. You won't need it. 
I just want to chat with you for a moment. I don't understand, Mr. Benson. I just want to talk to you, that's all. I don't believe you and I have ever talked before as person to person, have we? No, sir, we haven't. And you've been with me uh, seven years, isn't it? Seven years next month. Seven years, and we've never talked as equals. But then, I've never needed advice before. You've noticed that I never ask advice, I suppose. Well, yes, I have, Mr. Benson. Make your own decision and act upon it, is my motto. And yet, now I'm going to ask your advice as a woman, not as a secretary. Well, I... I'll try to be helpful if I can. Good. Now then, picture for yourself a woman who has always been very practical and, uh, well, let's say rather cold. Suddenly this woman becomes dreamy and absent-minded. She stands for minutes at the window, looking at nothing. You speak to her. She doesn't hear you. What would you deduce from that? Why, I'd say she was in love. Excellent. Now suppose this woman is married... Suppose on several occasions when her husband is in the room... You're following me, aren't you? Oh, yes, sir. Suppose on these occasions the phone rings and this married woman answers. And each time she tells the party calling he has a wrong number. What then? Why, I suppose that could happen. But now, Miss Johnson, suppose on several occasions the husband answers and the party at the other end hangs up without speaking... Why, it sounds like someone trying to call the wife without her husband knowing about it. Exactly. I felt sure I couldn't be wrong. But it's helpful to have your opinion and back me up. Thank you very much, Miss Johnson. Why, why not at all, Mr. Benson? And now, please send in Mr. Mungo. Yes, sir, right away. Mr. Benson will see you now. Okay, sister. Good morning, Mr. Benson. Come in, Mungo, and close the door. Sure, Mr. Benson. Uh, sit down. Yeah, sure. You have the information for me? Everything's right here in my report. Good, let's have it. I checked thoroughly on the four names you suggested. And which one was she meeting? I only witnessed one meeting, Mr. Benson. The other time, she gave me the slip. Then you don't know your business. Well, what she did was go to Duke and Baker's department store, take a dress into one of the fitting rooms, and then leave by another door. I couldn't very well follow her there. You should have managed it somehow. I... Well, never mind that. What did you learn? I'll give you the general report first before I mention the name. All right, do so, but don't dawdle about it. Yes, Mr. Benson. As you'll see, I've called the four individuals you suggested, parties A, B, C, and D. Yes. Now, party B, Mrs. Benson knew before her marriage, but I found no evidence they have ever communicated since. Yes, go on. Parties C and D, she also knew before she became Mrs. Benson, and from time to time, she's seen both of them since. Uh, but... Those meetings appear to have been accidental. Maybe so. Get on with it. But party A, the architect one, I traced him back to Atlanta. That's his hometown. Yeah? She comes from Atlanta, too. Yes, uh, They went to high school together. Were sweet on each other for a year or two. He used to keep her picture in his room. Oh, he did, did he? Yeah. And since he reached New York three months ago, he's phoned her four or five times, according to the switchboard operator at his apartment house. Yes, of course. I remember how excited she was when they met at the Jennings dance two months ago. And three days ago, get this, when Mrs. Benson was downtown shopping, she dropped into Rass for lunch and she ran into him there. No doubt it was a planned meeting. It was very cleverly done. Then they sat for two hours talking and... Well, that meeting was no accident. No, of course it wasn't. Donald Arkwright. Yes, I was sure of it. Yes, sir. But if you want me to keep on following... No, no, no. It's time for more decisive steps. I don't understand. You're not supposed to. But if you knew me better, you'd know that the moment my mind is made up, I act. I see, Mr. Benson. And I propose to act now. So send me your bill and forget the whole affair. Very good, Mr. Benson. I'll forget the whole affair. I'm very good at that. Good day, Mr. Benson. Goodbye. Hello, Donald Arkwright speaking. Oh, hello, Arkwright. This is Harvey Benson. You remember me, Linda's husband? Well, yes, yes, of course, Mr. Benson. How are you? Fine, thanks. I'm calling because I need an architect. Oh, and uh, you wanted me yes, to... Yes, I'm, I'm going to put up a summer place out on Long Island, and I wanted you to draw the plans. Well, that's great, Mr. Benson. Uh, 
Now, what kind of sight have you? I'll do better than tell you. I'll show it to you. That is, if you're free to drive out with me this morning. Well, I, I do have an appointment. Cancel but... it. This will be well worth your while, I assure you. Well, all right, I will, Mr. Benton. Good. Then I'll pick you up in my car. Say about uh, 45 minutes. All right, that'll be fine. I'll be looking for you. Good. I'll see you shortly, then. We'll have lunch on the way. Miss Johnson. Yes, Mr. Benson? I'm leaving for the day. Cancel any appointments I may have. Now Harvey Benson leaves his office, and we follow him to the garage where he keeps his car. Well, Joe, you have my car ready? I uh, got it right here, Mr. Benson. But look, uh, don't you want to take the new coupe? No, I said I wanted the sedan. Yeah, sure, but since that little accident Mrs. Benson had, the sedan ain't in too good a shape. It'll do for today. Yeah, but what I'm getting at is it, it ain't safe. I'm not worried. You put in plenty of gas? Yep. Five gallons, Mr. Benson. But look now, don't take no chances with them brakes. They don't hold worth a cent. I'm aware of that. And that right-hand door, it sticks something terrible. What of it? What do you care? Oh, I just thought I'd Well, don't. (laughs) Golly, he's certainly in a hurry. With them brakes the way they are, he'll kill somebody if he ain't careful. At 87th Street, Harvey Benson picks up his passenger, Donald Arkwright. And several hours later, they are far out in a lonely section of Long Island. Just a quarter of a mile more, Arkwright. Up ahead, on top of those cliffs. That's where my lots are. I uh, surely appreciate your asking me to prepare the plans, Mr. Benson. Linda suggested you for the job. Said you were a first-rate architect. Well, that's swell of her. I wasn't even sure she'd remember me. Oh, she remembers you very well. I could see how happy she was to meet you at the Jennings party. Yeah, I was tickled that she recognized me. After all, it's six years since we last met. Well, why shouldn't she recognize you? After all, you were sweethearts, weren't you? (laughs) Well, I suppose you could have called us that. We did have some good times together. Riding, hiking, and dancing. Well, it's plain she still thinks a lot of you. Now, there's the sight. Right up ahead. Oh, yes. Smack on the edge of the cliff, huh? Well, you'll have a nice view all the way across the sound. Eighty feet sheer to the water. Not another house in miles. Look, you can see all the way down to the rocks from the bend in the road here. Well, those waves sure are kicking up a fuss. A man wouldn't last long down there. No. No, not long. But you don't have to worry. I'll build you a house that'll never slide over the edge. I'm sure you'll never give me any cause to worry. Well, here we are. Have to pull the car a bit off the road, though, to park. Well, oh, pretty steep here. Yes. I'll have to put in a retaining wall. Terrace the ground, I guess. There. Ah, I got her off the road. Ah, we'll leave her here. Well, we'll have room to turn around when we're ready to start back. Sure hope you have good brakes. I'd hate to slide over under those rocks down there. I'd hate to myself. <laughs> oh, want to get out and block the wheels for me? Oh, yes, of course. Yeah. Door won't open. Seems to be stuck. That's right. That door does open hard. Never mind. I'll get out on this side and block them. Well, say, aren't you forgetting to set the brakes? Not necessary. But this slope is steep here. I know what I'm doing. But look, the car's moving already. It's starting to roll forward. Yes, it is, isn't it? And it'll keep on rolling. Mr. Benson? I, I can't stop your car. The brakes won't hold. Mr. Benson, it's gone over the cliff. It's gone over the cliff! Harvey stands there watching the car roll toward the edge while his passenger struggles frantically to get out. It only has ten feet to go, five feet, and then on the very edge, the wheels twist against a rock, and the car stops. Harvey runs down the slope and reaches the spot, just as Donald Arkwright manages at last to scramble out. Mr. Benson, you did that on purpose. Yes, Arkwright, I did. You tried to kill me. Exactly, I tried to kill you. But... Why? You... You must be crazy. No, Arkwright, only myself. 
If you knew me better, you'd know that no one tries to take anything away from me without suffering for it. What are you talking about? You know what I'm talking about. What's mine is mine. And everything that's mine, I keep. You are crazy. I can see it. Get away from me. Take your hands off of me. No, I... Get right. You haven't a chance. Yes. Let me go, I say. I'll... I'll... You'll do nothing. In this world, a man has to be strong and ruthless to stay on top. And I'm... Oh, no. No, you're pushing me toward the edge. Let me go. You're going over, Let do me... you hear? You're going over. No. No. For a moment, Harvey stands, glaring down at the white-capped waters that have received his victim. Then he turns to the car. A quick twist of the steering wheel, a push, and the car is gone. Then Harvey turns away back to the road. He walks a mile, two miles, three, until he gets a lift from a driver who takes him to the nearest state police barracks, where State Police Sergeant Thomas hears his story. Mr. Benson, you say you got out of the car to block the wheel and the car started rolling forward? Yes, Sergeant. Arkwright tried to open the door, but it stuck. The car was at the edge by the time he got it open. He he jumped, but he was too late. I see. All right, I have the details straight. Oh, it was horrible, Sergeant. He was my friend. There was nothing I could do to help. Nothing. Yes, I understand, Mr. Benson. You were quite alone at the time? No witnesses? No, we were miles from the nearest house. Why do you ask? Well, because there's a boy scout camp about a mile from there, Mr. Benson. I thought some of the boys might have been within sight. Oh, no, no. There wasn't anyone in sight. I see. Well, I guess that's all, Mr. Benson. It's just about dark now, so we probably won't recover the body before tomorrow. I'll notify you the minute we do so you can identify your friend. And so, late in the evening, Harvey returns home to find Linda waiting for him anxiously. Is that you, Harvey? Yes, my dear, it is. Well, I waited dinner as long as I could, and then I went ahead and ate. Shall I fix you something now? No, thank you. I've eaten. Let's sit down, Linda. I'd like to talk to you. Why, why, of course, Harvey. Do you have the phone fixed? The phone? Oh, no. I-, I called the company, but they said there was nothing wrong with it. I see. Well, they were quite right. I discovered that the trouble was from another source. I don't think I understand you, Harvey. Linda, my dear, do you consider me a fool? What? Well, of course not. Don't you suppose that I've known what was going on for some days now? Just what do you mean, Harvey? When a woman suddenly takes to mooning around the house, staring out the window, not answering when she's spoken to, the signs are unmistakable. Are you speaking about me, Harvey? And when that same woman gets several phone calls while her husband is in the room and each time tells the caller, I'm afraid you have the wrong number. There's no one here by that name. It would be a very stupid husband indeed who failed to notice. Yes. Yes, I suppose it would. But the crowning touch was those calls when there was no one on the line. One several days ago, one last night, and now one this morning. But Harvey... I I... answer and there's no one on the line. But who's there when you answer? That's what I want to know, Linda. Well, what have you to say? There isn't much I can say, Harvey. Oh, then you admit it. Those calls were from someone I wasn't supposed to know about. Someone you're in love with. Yes. Someone I'm in love with. Someone I've been trying to bring myself to tell you about. Someone you've been meeting at Tawdry Rendezvous. Nothing of the kind. We've met, yes. But they've been perfectly innocent meetings, lunch, and a walk in the park. Nothing worse than that. (laughs) You're a fool to expect me to believe that. Yes, I, I suppose I am. And yet it's the truth. Well, it doesn't matter. But may I inquire what your plans are? I want a divorce, Harvey. So that you can marry this unknown who telephones you and then hangs up when I answer. Yes. And I'm sorry that ever happened. It was my fault. I suggested it. You see, I was afraid of you, Harvey. Afraid? Of me? Of your loving husband? I was. But I'm not anymore. I only want to be free of you. Free to marry the man I really love. Very interesting, my dear. But slightly impractical. 
Do you really think I'd let anyone take you away from me? I'm afraid you have no choice. Well, you're wrong. It's you who have no choice. You're penniless, Linda. You have no family, no money, no training. You have only me. What are you trying to say? I'm just leading up to a story I have to tell you, Linda. A very tragic story which occurred only this afternoon. And so Harvey tells Linda the story of the afternoon's uh, events. Well, not the true story, of course. But she guesses the truth as he speaks and recoils in horror when he is finished. Oh, you've killed him. You deliberately murdered him. Nonsense. It was a tragic accident. The police have already exonerated him. You me. killed him? Oh, no. No, I don't believe you. You're just trying to torture me. You know me better than that. You know that what I have, I keep at any cost. Then you did kill him. You're a murderer. Don't be hysterical, my dear. I shall be forced to discipline you. I'm going to the police. I'm going to tell them the truth. Linda, come back here. No, no, you can't stop Linda, me. Linda, come back. Come back, I say. Linda is gone before Harvey can get to the door. Harvey pauses, irresolute. Then he shrugs, turns back, sits down, lights a cigar. Hmm. Good cigar. I must remember to order another box. And so, Linda, you've rushed off to the police. In your heart of hearts, you hope that I'm lying. Your first move will be to rush to a telephone. You'll put a nickel and dial with trembling fingers. You'll hear the phone at the other end ring. And with beating heart, you'll wait. Hoping against hope that Donald Arkwright will answer. <laughs> but he won't. And then you'll know I've told the truth. Then... Hmm. Will you come back first? Or will you go on to the police? I rather think you'll go to the police. For you are excited just now. And you'll return with a detective or two. I shall have to explain to them... Tell them of your hysterical spells. Then you and I will be left alone. And in a day or two, I think we'll leave on a little trip. Yes, up to my hunting lodge, where we can be alone there. And we'll get to know each other well again. Very well. And in the future... Ah, oh, the bell. So you're back already, Linda. I guessed wrong. Just a moment, my dear. I'm coming. Harvey crosses to the door, opens it, and recoils in surprise. Good evening, Mr. Manson. Well, if it isn't Sergeant Thomas. And I see my wife is with you. Yes, we met in the lobby. She came back up with me. I'd like to come in. Why, of course. After you, Mrs. Manson. These other men will wait out here. Thank you, Sergeant. And now do sit down, Linda. And you too, Sergeant. Oh, uh, cigar. No, thanks. We might as well waste no time, Mr. Fenton. We've recovered your friend's body. Already? But surely you didn't come here to tell me that. They know you killed him, Harvey. They know. Please, Linda. You must forgive my wife, Sergeant. She's overwrought. I, I suppose she's been babbling some nonsense rather to you. She told me a story. I don't think it's nonsense. Of course it is. She's hysterical. But there were witnesses, Harvey. There were witnesses. What? That's absurd. There was no one within miles. Except a camp of boy scouts. Four of them with a scoutmaster were lying in the grass half a mile away when you drove up. They were watching for birds with field glasses. You're lying. And with natural curiosity, they turned their glasses on you. They saw your struggle on the cliff. No, no. You're lying. They went to another police barracks to report or I'd have been here sooner. Here are copies of the affidavits they signed. Affidavits? Yeah. Look them over. Affidavits. Five of them. Yes, they seem to be in order. So, there were witnesses. I dare say their evidence is unshakable. You haven't a chance, Benson. Well, those men outside are city detectives. Are you going to come quietly? Yes. Why not? What else? Is there to do? You're caught, Harvey, and I'm glad, glad. Yes, I'm caught. 
But precious little good that'll do you, Linda, because he's dead, do you hear? Donald Arkwright is dead. Donald Arkwright? Yes. You wonder how I knew it was he, don't you? Well, I hired a private detective. Oh. And he discovered that Arkwright had been phoning you. That oh, you'd been no. slipping away to meet him. He managed to follow you to one of those innocent luncheons. Oh, that luncheon? But that meeting was an accident. A very clever accident. But not clever enough to save Arkwright because he's dead, do you hear? And no matter what happens to me, I've beaten you. You're insane. You always have been with your lust for power. And I never guessed it till now. Fine words. But they won't change the fact that your beloved is dead and that I've taken him from you. You killed Donald Arkwright because you thought I was in love with him. <laughs> You've killed the wrong man. No, I didn't. It was Arkwright. I know it. Oh, no. Don Arkwright was just an old friend. The man I love is someone you've never met, whose name I see now you don't even know. I don't believe you. You've committed murder and you've been caught, and all for nothing. No. And that knowledge is worse to you than any punishment the law can inflict. You're lying. It was Arkwright who phoned and hung up when I answered. I tell you, it was. It couldn't have been anybody else. It... No. No. Better answer it, Mrs. Benson. No, I'll answer it. Hello? 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 again. Well, that was rather a hectic 24 hours for Harvey Benson, wasn't it? He shouldn't have been quite so sure of himself. It never pays. Those phone calls now. If you get any calls and find there's no one on the line, uh, don't be quite as hasty as he was. You might get into a bad jam. I know someone else who didn't wait to make sure of his facts, and he... Oh, you're getting off here. Oh, I'm sorry, but I'm sure we'll meet again. I take this same train every week at this time. You've just heard The Mysterious Traveler, a series of dramas of the strange and terrifying. In today's cast were Maurice Tarplin, Ted Osborne, Mary Jane Higby, Jack Manning, and James Van Dyke. Original music was played by Doc Whipple. The Mysterious Traveler is written and directed by Bob Arthur and David Cogan. Listen next week over most of these mutual stations to a tale titled... Death Whispers Softly. Another tale of the mysterious traveler. The Mysterious Traveler is presented by the Mutual Network from our New York studios. Russ Dunbar speaking. What could have been in the little black box that led intelligence men, Nazi agents, and Mike Waring, the Falcon on a chase of mystery and intrigue over two continents. You'll learn the answer when you hear Death Comes in Boxes, this Tuesday night's mystery on the adventures of the Falcon. Tune in Tuesday for The Falcon. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.
Traveler. This is the mysterious Traveler, inviting you to join him on another journey into the realm of the strange and terrifying. I hope you will enjoy the trip, that it will thrill you a little and chill you a little. So settle back, get a good grip on your nerves. Where are we going? We're going to journey to the grave and learn the secrets of the dead in a tale titled The Accusing Corpse. Some years ago, when I was a county coroner, I was called in on a most interesting case. A case which had begun in the country home of Philip Drake, the wealthy stockbroker. Roger, thank goodness you were able to get here in time. I left town right after I received your call. What's wrong, Philip? You sounded so upset over the phone. It's Vivian. She's upstairs in her room packing. She says she's leaving me. Leaving you? Why? She seems to feel our marriage has been a mistake. Roger, won't you speak to her? Persuade her to stay. After all, she is your sister. I'm afraid, Philip, that Vivian and I have never been as close as sister and brother should be. She's always been wild and spoiled. Perhaps, Philip, it would be better if... If you were to let her go. No, I couldn't do that. I love her, Roger. I wouldn't want to live without her. Won't you please try to persuade her to stay? All right, Philip. I'll do my best. But I must warn you, I haven't much influence well, over her. Well, I'm all packed and ready to... Why, Roger, darling, what a surprise. What are you doing here? Vivian, Philip has told me. Now, surely you can't be serious... You know how he loves you, everything he's done to make you happy. Now, uh, Roger, you aren't going to start on that, are you? Someday, Vivian, you'll get just what you deserve for walking over people, breaking their hearts. Every time I think of you being my sister, I feel Roger, like... Roger, please. Would you mind waiting in the other room? I'd like to speak to Vivian alone. Oh, all right, Philip. Call me when you want me. <sighs> really, Philip. No matter what you have to say, you're just wasting your time. Oh, Vivian, how can you do this to me? You know I love you, that I'd do anything to make you happy. That's sweet of you, dear. Would you mind lending me your car to get to town? If you leave me, Vivian, you won't get a cent. Not the cent, do you hear? Really? Did you ever stop to think, Philip, that there might be another man huh? with more money than you? Another man? Oh, no, there couldn't be. And why not? But we've only been married three months. There, there couldn't be anyone in that time. Oh, but there was. Oh, Vivian, in spite of what you've done... I'm willing to forgive you and start over with you. <laughs> but, darling, I don't want you to forgive me. I want you to forget me. Vivian, you can't do this to me. I love you. I won't let you go. I really must be saying goodbye now. He's waiting for me in town, and I don't want to be late. If I can't have you, no one else will, do you hear? Oh, really, Philip, you're being ridiculous. I must go. No. Philip, what are you doing? A gun. Yes, Vivian, a gun. I told you if I couldn't have you, no one else would. Oh, Philip, you're insane. Put that gun down. If you don't change your mind about leaving, I'll kill you. Even with that gun, you can't keep me, do you hear? I'd sooner die than go on living with you. I'm going. And you're not going to stop. <laughs> oh, you... You shot... Vivian. Philip. Philip, Philip, what happened? I, I thought I heard... Vivian. Roger. Is she... Dead? Yes. Philip, do you, do you know what this may mean? Life imprisonment, perhaps. E even the electric chair. I know. Nothing seems to matter now. But, but you simply can't throw your life away like that, Philip. Oh, even if Vivian was my sister, I don't mind telling you that I always felt you were far too good for her. She didn't deserve to be your wife. Oh, please, Roger. Now, look, Philip. If, if we were to get rid of the body... Who could possibly know that she didn't leave here tonight as she'd planned? No. No, it wouldn't work, Roger. You can't get away with murder. That's nonsense, Philip. Now, now if we were to bury her in the woods, no one would ever find the body. Bury her in the woods? I couldn't do that. Well, then I'll do it. You can wait here till I return. But, Roger, what if, Philip, you must let me handle this? You, you'd better give me the gun. All right, Roger. You are. Good. Now, now you wait here while I get rid of the body.
Philip watched, spellbound, unable to say a word, as Roger picked up the body and left the room. As Roger, carrying his burden past the gardener's shed, he picked up a shovel. In a few moments, he reached the woods which began at the rear of the house and extended for miles. He carefully made his way through the forest underbrush until he was well out of sight of the house. Then he stopped and looked about. Uh, I, I think this is quite far enough. I think you can put me down now, Roger. I'm tired of being carried like a sack of potatoes. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> well, let me congratulate you on your performance as a corpse. <laughs> Do you think he suspects anything? <laughs> of course he doesn't. He's positive that he shot and killed you. You've got the gun, haven't you? Well, certainly I've got it. You don't think I was going to let him discover that the bullets had been removed and blank cartridges substituted, do you? Oh, no. Not you, Roger. You always know what you're doing. I always try to, my dear sister. You don't think Philip will give you any trouble, do you? Outside of being in love with me, he isn't an utter fool. <laughs> don't worry. I can handle Philip. Now, uh, here's the key to the apartment I rented in town. You'll find my car a quarter of a mile down the road. All right. I'll be waiting for you at the apartment. I'll be there in a few hours. Oh, now, now, let me see. Yes. Yes, this seems like a nice place to dig. The next morning, Roger called on Philip at his office. With a calculating glance, he noted that Philip's eyes were bloodshot, that his hand trembled as the two shook hands. How are you, Philip? I couldn't sleep at all last night. I kept thinking of Vivian. And what if her disappearance is noticed? People begin asking questions. Now, all you have to do is tell them that Vivian left you and, and you don't know where she is. Or oh, things like that happen every day. You've been very helpful to me, Roger. If ever I get a chance to repay you for it, rest assured, I will. That's very good of you, Philip. The uh, truth of the matter is, you, uh, you could do me a favor, if you would. Of course. What is it? Well, I'm in the midst of a business deal, and I find myself a little short of capital. If you could lend me some money, I'd appreciate it. Oh, certainly, Roger. How much do you need? Mm, 20,000. 20,000? That's quite a lot. Naturally, Philip, if you feel you can't lend it to me, I'll go to a bank and try to borrow oh, it. It isn't that I can't lend it to you, Roger. It's just that the amount surprised me. Uh, shall I make the check out to you? Uh, y yes, if you please. All right. I can't tell you how much I appreciate this, Philip. As Philip wrote out a check for $20,000, Roger smiled. Things were working out just as he had planned. Well, an hour later, Roger entered an old brownstone house and went to apartment 2C. <laughs> Did you get it? <laughs> what does this look like? Oh, Roger, that's wonderful. Now we can clear out and... Why, there isn't 100,000 here. <laughs> no, my dear. I only got 20,000 from him. But we were after 100,000. Why didn't you get it all this morning when you saw him? My dear Vivian, it simply isn't done that way. Uh, blackmail is an art. An art that calls for the use of psychology. Philip will give us many times over the money I hold in my hand... All in due time, of course. You mean I'll have to go on hiding in this miserable apartment until you've finished your little game with him? Never being able to leave it for fear someone will recognize come, it. Come, come now, Vivian. You've got the radio and books I and won't other... spend weeks in this apartment, I tell you. I won't... My arm! You'll do exactly as I say, Vivian. Exactly, do you understand? Roger, my arm, you're hurting it's me. It's nothing to what I'll do if you disobey me. Do I make myself clear? Yes, yes! <laughs> A week passed, a week in which Roger patiently bided his time. For time, he knew, was working on his side against Philip. Then one morning, he called on Philip at his office. Good morning, Philip. How are you? How do you expect me to be? This past week, I've been able to think of nothing but Vivian and what happened that night. Philip, you must stop brooding over it. Whatever happened was her fault, not yours. Yes, you're right. Perhaps what I need is a vacation. Yes, yes, of course. A trip would do you a world of good. And if I could afford it, I'd go along with you. You mean you haven't any money? I'm, I'm afraid not, Philip. That's what I've come to see you about. 
I must have $40,000 at once. $40,000? Yes, I, I know it's a good deal of money, Philip, but without it, I'll be ruined. Well, naturally, I want to help you, Roger, but $40,000... If I don't get the $40,000, Philip, it may mean prison for me. Now, you wouldn't want to see that happen, would you? Well, of course not, Roger, well, but... After all, Philip, I, I saved you from prison. In fact, I made myself an accomplice to Vivian's murder by not turning you over to the police. Well, yes, I know, now, but... You, you could hardly expect me to remain loyal to you if you weren't willing to help me, could you? I see. It seems I haven't any choice. Very well, Roger. I'll write you out a check. Roger's eyes gleamed in amusement as he accepted the check from Philip. There was no longer any doubt that Philip understood him perfectly. Things were working out exactly as he had planned. Later that day, Roger went back to the old brownstone house. There was a smile on his lips as he entered apartment 2C. <laughs> Look at this. $40,000 in cash. Oh, Roger. Now, wasn't this worth staying in hiding for, Vivian? And there's plenty more where this came from. Who could that be? You better get behind that screen. No. Oh. All right, Roger. Uh, yes? C.O.D. for Miss Brown. It amounts to $64. Oh, uh, you must be mistaken. There's no Miss Brown here. This is the address she gave. It's in care of Mr. Roger Martinson. Is that your name? Why, why yes, but I don't know uh, any... Those packages are for me, Roger. Uh, how much did you say the C.O.D. was? $64, Miss. Oh. Here you are. Thank you, Miss. Here's your receipt. Goodbye. Goodbye. When did you buy those clothes? This morning. You mean you went out shopping in spite of what I told you? Well, I was sick of being cooped up in this apartment day and night. I had to do something for a change. And what of my plans? You risk everything with so much at stake. Roger, stop looking at me like that. I tell you, I couldn't stand being cooped up in this apartment any longer. But I gave you orders to stay here. Well, I won't. I want you to get the rest of the money at once so we can clear out. And if you don't, I'll go shopping whenever I feel like it. You can't make me stay here. <gasps> You'll do exactly as I say, Vivian. I won't allow anything or anyone to interfere with my plans. I've worked out every step perfectly, and there isn't going to be any slip-up. Another week passed, a week in which Roger made no effort to see Philip. Then early one evening, he got into his car and drove out of the city to Philip's home in the country. Oh, it's you, Roger. Come in. Good evening, Philip. Oh, uh, where are the servants? This is their night off. Oh. Uh, you're, uh, you're not looking well at all, Philip. You, you shouldn't remain in this house by yourself. What difference does it make where I am? Wherever I go, the memory of that night follows. It's hard to believe that it was only two weeks ago tonight that I killed her. Two weeks ago tonight? Well, so it was. Oh, well, uh, oh, by the way, Philip, do you think you might possibly lend me $60,000? $60,000? You can't be serious. Oh, but I am. But I lent you that much already. Yes, I know, but I must have more. No. I won't give you another cent. You've blackmailed me enough. Blackmail is a harsh word. Philip. What else can you call it? You're just as hard and grasping as Vivian was. Yes, but you must remember I'm alive and she isn't. I suppose you're glad she's dead. In life, she was worth nothing to you. In death, you're able to get $60,000 for her. In death? How do I know she is dead? Now, don't be foolish, Philip. You saw her lying on the floor in this very room. Yes, but how do I know she's dead? It was you who examined her and told me so. And you buried the body by yourself. Well, I, I just wanted to spare you, Philip. Just exactly where did you bury Vivian? As a matter of fact, how do I know the whole affair isn't staged for my special benefit so that you can extort money from me? Oh, surely you don't believe that, Philip. Why, you shot her with your own gun. Yes, and you took the gun away from me immediately after the shooting. Suddenly that whole affair is becoming very clear to I me. I tell you, she's dead, Philip, and buried out in the woods. Then I want to see the grave and the body you say is in it. But this is ridiculous. I, I won't go searching for a grave in the middle of the night. You shouldn't have to search for it, Roger. Not if you really dug one. Come along, we can pick up a shovel of the tool shed. I won't do it, I won't do it. I it's said come along, Roger. Oh, 
Very well. But I'm not certain I'll be able to find the grave. After all, the woods is fairly large, and it's been two weeks since I buried her. That's all right, Roger. We'll stay out there until you do find her. A few minutes later, Philip and Roger picked up the shovel at the tool shed and then continued on their way to the woods that began at the rear of the house. Neither of the men spoke as they entered the woods. Roger leading the way with a flashlight. Several times he stopped, trying to get his bearings, then plunged on again, hoping to find a, a familiar landmark. It became apparent that Roger was growing less and less sure of himself. Oh, the grave is someplace around here. I'm certain of it. Perhaps we ought to come back in the daytime. It, it might be easier to find it then. I know, Roger. You shouldn't have any trouble finding it now, if it exists. It does exist, I tell you. It's, it's just that the woods are so confusing at night. Everything looks so, so different. Just keep on searching, Roger. Well, perhaps this is the spot. It, it looks something like it. Well, is it or isn't I, it? I, I don't know. It looks like the place where I buried her, and yet... Yet I'm, I, I'm not certain. There's only one way to make certain, and that's to start digging. Here, here's the shovel. But suppose this isn't the spot. Then we'll dig somewhere else. In fact, we'll dig up the entire woods if necessary. After all, you're certain she is buried in the woods, aren't you? Go ahead, Roger. Start digging. Oh, oh very well. <laughs> Roger, you've been digging for 20 minutes now, and you haven't uncovered a body. Uh, Philip, I told you I wasn't sure this was the spot where I buried her. You're a great actor, Roger. But I'm afraid this time you've overplayed your role. Uh, what do you mean? Vivian isn't dead. And there's no use your pretending she is. Everything that's happened was part of a scheme the two of you planned to extort money from me. I tell you she is dead. Then where's the body? I thought this was the spot, but I must be mistaken. I'm sure I didn't bury her any deeper than this, but if I... Philip, turn the flashlight this way. What is it? Look. Do you see what I've uncovered? <gasps> a hand? Yes. This is the spot where I buried her, Philip. Just a few more shovelfuls and I'll have her uncovered. Oh. Oh, it can't be. There. Ah, there you are, Philip. Of course, she's been in the ground for two weeks, but... I think you can easily recognize that it's Vivian. Yes, it's Vivian. And look, Philip, here's the bullet hole under her heart. The bullet hole that you made. I don't want to see any more. I've had enough. You should trust me a little more, Philip. Everything I did was for your own good. After all, you, you don't want to go to the electric chair, do you? I don't care what happens anymore. I can't stand having her death on my conscience any longer. I'm going to call the police. Don't be a fool, Philip. You know it might well mean the electric chair. I'll take my chances. Anything's better than going on living the way I have these past two weeks. I'm going back to the house and call the police. Philip, Philip, come back. Come back. Philip! Operator. Operator. Philip, Philip, wait. Wait, don't do anything foolish. No, you cut me off. Take your hands off that phone, Roger. What I want you to do, Philip, is to listen to me for a few minutes. At the end of that time, you may, you may do as you please. Now, that's fair enough, isn't it? Nothing you can say will make me change my mind about calling the now, police. listen to me first. Then if you still want to call the police, you can. Now, please put the receiver down, Philip. Yeah, that's it. Well, what do you want to tell me? Well, uh, do you mind if I mix myself a drink first? It's, it's been a rather difficult evening. Very well. Oh, well, what about one for you, Philip? You look as though you could stand a drink. No, thank you. Oh, nonsense. It'll do you good. What is it you want to say to me, Roger? Huh? Oh, oh yes, say to you. Oh, yes. Yes, of course. Uh, here's your drink, Philip. Thank you. Well, now, uh, what shall we drink to? Uh, we'll drink to your good luck, come what may. Ah, there. I feel a good deal better. All right. Now that we've had our drinks, what have you got to say? Oh, oh yes, yes, I, uh... What I wanted to say was I... 
I never let anything interfere with my plans, Philip. What do you mean by that? Simply that I can't allow you to go to the police, and therefore you shan't. It would spoil my plan. No, oh, it would, would it? Well, I'd like to see you stop me. I have, Philip. In a very little while, in fact, in just a few seconds, you'll be dead. Dead? What are you saying? Yes, Philip. The drink I mixed for you was poisoned. Poison? Aren't you finding that it's becoming uh, difficult to breathe? Oh, no, you couldn't have. I... My throat it burns. Yes, I know, Philip, but it'll all be over in a matter of seconds. Now, I, I see it all. You, you might... Yes, Philip, just a week ago tonight, she uh, died according to plan. Uncle, please, Joe. I'm afraid, Philip, that you haven't the strength left to reach the telephone. I will. Uh-huh. I'm afraid you and Vivian never had a chance, Philip. I had things worked out perfectly, down to the smallest detail. Hello, operator. Uh, operator... Please connect me with the police. It was at this point that I was called into the case. Inspector Carlton called me an hour after Roger Martinson had phoned the police. When I arrived at the Drake mansion, I examined the body of Vivian Drake and that of her husband, Philip. When I had finished my examination, I entered the library where Inspector Carlton was questioning Roger Martinson. Hello, Doc. Oh, Doc, this is Roger Martinson. Mr. Martinson, this is Dr. Smith, the county coroner. How do you do? Hello. I'll be with you in a few minutes, Doc. Just stick around. Now, Mr. Martinson, you were telling me how you came to this house two weeks ago tonight to see your sister and found that she was gone. Uh, yes. Yes, my brother-in-law, Philip, told me that she'd gone on a vacation... Now, I thought it strange at the time that she should have gone away without saying goodbye to me, as we were always very close. But days passed, and, and I didn't hear from her. Tell me, was it like your sister to go away and not write? No, no, it wasn't, and, and that's what worried me so. These past two weeks, Philip kept putting me off when I inquired about Vivian's whereabouts. Well, tonight I, tonight I, I couldn't stand it any longer. And I came to this house to have it out with him. What did your brother-in-law say when he saw you? Well, he was quite agitated at my unexpected arrival. When I couldn't get any satisfaction out of him regarding Vivian, I, I threatened to go to the police. Then he broke down and confessed that he murdered Vivian. When did he murder her? He told me that he'd done it two weeks ago tonight. Why, that was the very night I'd come here to see Vivian, and he told me that she'd left for a vacation. Mm, I see. Go on. Naturally, when he told me he'd murdered her, I, I was aghast. He led me to the woods and, and showed me the grave. We returned to the house, and before I knew what had happened... Philip had taken poison. Then I called the police. Well, it seems like a plain case of murder and suicide. Outside of a few questions at the inquest, I don't think we'll trouble you anymore, Mr. Oh, Martinson. that's quite all right, Inspector. I shall be at your service any time. Uh, just a moment, Mr. Martinson. Uh, yes? I was very much interested in hearing what you had to say to the inspector regarding the murder of your sister. You say that your brother-in-law confessed to murdering her two weeks ago tonight? Uh, that's right. That would be um, April 2nd, wouldn't it? Um, yes, that's correct. Then you never saw her alive after the night of April 2nd? Why, oh, I know, of course not. What are you getting at, Doc? Please, Inspector. Mr. Martinson, would you mind telling me where you live? I, at uh, 425 West 107th Street. Tell me, were some clothes delivered to that address in your care a week ago today, April 9th? Clothes? Yes. To be exact, a woman's sports suit, which cost $64 and arrived COD. Why, why no? You're lying, Mr. Martinson. I have in my hand a slip of paper that not only proves that you're lying, but that will send you to the electric chair. Doc, what do you say? Yes, Inspector. Mr. Martinson's plan was perfect, but he, he slipped up badly. He forgot to search Vivian Drake's clothing before he buried her. When I examined her body just now... I found in one of her pockets this receipted bill bearing the date April 9th. That proves beyond a doubt that she wasn't murdered by her husband on April 2nd. 
as Mr. Martinson here no. claims. No, no. Yes, Mr. Martinson, the corpse has accused you from the grave of murder and has given us proof of your guilt. No, no, it can't be. I had everything planned perfectly, perfectly, do you hear? Down to the last detail. I couldn't have failed. I couldn't have... This is the mysterious traveler again. Have you enjoyed our little trip to the grave? Poor Roger. What a pity. After all that planning and hard work, to be tripped up by a sail slip found on a corpse. It just goes to prove that you have to be more careful when you're burying people you've murdered. Now, I recall another case where a woman drugged her husband and... Oh, you're getting off at the next stop. I'm sorry. I hope you'll join me again soon. But if you do, please remember this. Next Sunday, I shall take a train that leaves at 3.30 p.m. Eastern Wartime. Don't forget, Sunday afternoon at half past three. You've just heard Chapter 20 of The Mysterious Traveler, a series of dramas of the strange and unusual brought to you each week by Station WOR. In tonight's program, The Accusing Corpse, Don Randolph played Roger. Also featured were Maurice Tarplin and Philip Clark. The Mysterious Traveler, written by Bob Arthur and David Cogan, is directed by Jock McGregor. Original music was played by Doc Whipple. Listen next week to a tale titled Escape by Death. Another tale of the mysterious traveler. The mysterious traveler is presented by WOR Mutual every Sunday over most of these stations. But beginning next week, the mysterious traveler will be presented at a new time, Sunday afternoons at 3.30. Please note the change in time. 3.30 every Sunday afternoon, beginning next Sunday. This is Mutual. Mysterious Traveler. This is the Mysterious Traveler, inviting you to join me on another journey into the realm of the strange and the terrifying. I hope you will enjoy the trip, that it will thrill you a little and chill you a little. So settle back and get a good grip on your nerves. If you can. Where are we going? Why, we're going to pay a visit to the home of Albert and Louise Jordan. As nice a couple as you'd hope to meet. In a story I call... <coughs> Death is the Visitor. My story begins in the Jordan home late on a hot summer night. Albert Jordan is asleep and is having a nightmare about his mother-in-law. Oh, no. No. You can't pull the wool over my eyes, Albert Jordan. I'm on to your ways. <laughs> Think that my only child was foolish enough to elope with you. But you made her do it, Albert. You made her. No, no. She wanted As long as I'm alive, she'll be protected from you. Albert, are you listening? Leave me alone. Leave me alone. Please. Darling, wake up. What? What is it? You are having a nightmare, dear. You don't want to wake Mother up. She needs a good night's sleep for a trip tomorrow. Oh, oh yes, the trip. I wish it was tomorrow already. She was gone. Oh, 
Are you sure you have everything, Mother? Yes, Louise. Everything I need for my trip home is in this handbag. Oh, oh, now don't forget to ship my trunk. I've already notified the expressman, Mother. He'll be here to pick it up this morning. Thank you, dear. Well, it's almost 9 o'clock, Mother. You'll miss your train. I've never missed a train in my life. You needn't be so anxious to get rid of me, Albert. Not really, Mother, I didn't mean... Oh, Louise, darling, I do hate leaving you alone like this. But, Mother, I'm not alone. I have Albert. Well, I don't mind saying it right to his face. I don't trust him, Louise, and I never will. I'm really wrong about people, you know that. Now, see here, Mother, I've had about enough. Louise and I get along perfectly well when you're not here. See, Louise, what a temper he has. Do you want me to stay, darling? Oh, really, Mother, I'm very happy with Albert. Oh, well, very well, then I'll go. But you'd better be good to her, Albert. Yes, Mother, I will. Well, goodbye. And don't forget, Louise, Mother will be back if you need her. Yes, Mother. Bye. Louise, if your mother pays us just one more visit, I'll leave this house for good. Albert, what are you saying? In the past year, she spent eight months with us. She has her clothes here, a key to the house. Why, she's even listed in the phone book under, under our number. I tell you, I won't be responsible for what happens if she doesn't stay away. I'll write to her, Albert, and try to explain. Really, I will. Make her understand that we have our own lives to lead. You know, now that she's gone, I, I feel like a new man. I can breathe in my own house. Oh, Albert, you won't forget to put the tags on Mother's trunk, will you? The expressman will be here for it soon. No, dear. Shipping your mother's trunk to her will be one thing I certainly won't forget. My trunk can remain here. Mother, but you went to catch your train. I know I did, but I changed my mind about going. I won't leave my little girl alone. Why are you looking so startled, Albert? Are you hiding something from me? No. No, of course not. Where's Louise? She went downtown a, an hour ago. Uh -huh. She should be home soon. I'm sure at least she'll be glad to see me. I... Oh, you haven't locked my trunk yet. That's good. So you've come back again. <laughs> You've always wanted to get rid of me, Albert. Keep me away from my only child, but I refuse to give her up. Yes, I've come back, Albert, and I'm staying for good. Frankly, I don't trust you. You don't trust me? No. I don't even know your background. For all I know, you may have criminal tendencies. There's a certain amount of the criminal in all of us. Most people can control their worst instincts. And some can't. Exactly. And I'm here to see to it that no one harms Louise. But, Mother, who's going to look out for you? Uh, Albert, why are you looking so queerly at me? Are you sick? Yes, Mother, I'm sick. Sick of the sight of you. Albert, stop looking at me that way. Why, you seem like a different person. I am, Mother. You've made me different. And now you must take the consequences. Albert, stay away from me. Don't you dare come near me. So you would keep coming back, Mother. Well, you came back just once too often. No, no, Albert. Don't touch me. Albert, <laughs> oh. Oh. You should have taken <laughs> that train, Mother. But at least now, I know you won't be coming back ever again. I... I didn't want to kill you, but you made me. Oh, but now I, I've got to get rid of you or they'll catch me. The trunk. Yes, it, it's large enough. Even in death, you're a problem, Mother. But you won't be for long. There. Now I'll have to get rid of the trunk somehow. I'll think of a way. Albert, are you home? Louise. Trunk. I've got to close it. Is that you, Albert? I, yes, dear. Yes. Oh, I see. You're locking the trunk. Yes, I was just getting it ready for the expressman. He should be here by now. Albert, is anything wrong? Uh, anything wrong? <laughs> what do you mean, Louise? I don't know. Your face is so flushed. Oh, it's just a little warm in here, that's all. Oh, we forgot to pack Mother's robe. Look. Oh, you'll have to open the trunk again, Albert. No. I, I mean, 
The trunk's full already. You wouldn't be able to get anything else into it. Why, nonsense. When Mother and I packed it, it was only half full. Oh, please open it. But it's locked and we haven't got the keys. Oh, yes, that's right. Mother has them. Well, we'll just have to mail the robe to her. Oh, I'll answer the door. It must be the expressman. Make sure the tags are on it, dear. Uh, the tags. Oh, she can't go to her home. Oh, if I only had time to think, think. Wait, yes, the, that's the only thing to do. Let's go. Oh, come this way, please. You'll find the trunk in this room. <clears throat> Here it is. Are you finished, Albert? Yes, it's all ready to go. Okay. Well, let me make a record of it. Now, let me see. It's being shipped to... Uh, perhaps you'd better load it on the truck first. It's easier this way, mister. Uh, you're shipping it to uh, Mr. William Smith, 345 oh. Wood Street, Las Vegas. Well, well, that isn't the right address. Then uh, what, what is it on this uh, shipping tag, lady? Oh, uh, well, that must be one of my customers. I must have been thinking of someone else when I wrote it out. Yeah, but well, what's the right address? Uh, oh, it's Mrs. Hortense Murdoch, 125 River Road, Ferrydale, Pennsylvania. Uh, that's right, isn't it, dear? Yes. Okay, I know your name and address. Uh, I'll put the right tags on later. Uh, uh, that's mighty heavy. Oh, please be careful with it. Don't worry, lady. I'll get the place it's on. Albert, did you get the mail just now? Yes, dear. Is there a letter from Mother yet? No, no, just a few bills. Oh, I'm really worried. It's a week now and no word from her. But you mustn't worry, Louise. I'm sure she's all right. Why, Albert, you're even worried yourself about her. You look so upset. Oh, I'll answer. I'll come with you. Maybe it's a special delivery for Mother. Yes? Hey, good morning. I got a trunk here for you folks. What? It's Mother's trunk. Yes. You always wanted to get rid of me, Albert. But I've come back, Albert, and I'm staying for good. Bring it in, won't you, please? Okay, lady. <laughs> There you are. But I don't understand. Why should Mother send her trunk back to us? Now, would you mind signing for it, uh, Mr. Jordan? What? Oh, yes. Here you are. Thanks. Bye. Albert, I, I can't understand why Mother shipped her trunk back to us and without even writing a word about it. Can you figure it out? Well, what? Oh, no, I can't. Well, I'm going to put an end to this guessing. Louise, what are you going to do? I'm calling Mother. Hello, operator. I want to put through a call to Ferrydale, Pennsylvania. The number is 223. Well, why bother, Louise? I'm sure there's a letter on the way. Oh, I've waited long enough for one. I'm sure there's something wrong. Oh, hello. Oh, hello, Sarah. This is Louise calling. Is my mother there? What? Are you sure? Oh, and that's why you shipped the trunk back. No, no. Thank you, Sarah. Albert, Sarah says that Mother never arrived home. She sent a postcard saying not to expect her just yet. It was Sarah the one who shipped the trunk back? Yes. She thought that Mother had decided to stay with us longer and would need her clothes. What? Albert, where can she be? Oh, now, Louise, I'm sure she's all right. All right, she's been missing a week. How could she be? Well, perhaps she's staying with friends. Oh, you know Mother hasn't any friends. We've got to do something. Albert, I'm going to call the police. <laughs> The police investigated, but they had no clues, so they didn't learn anything. And George got rid of the embarrassing trunk just as fast as he could. Telling Louise he was going to put it into storage, he took it to a trucking company to ship it as far away as it could go. It was the only thing he could think of to do. All right, I got it straight, I guess, now. Mr. Richard Jones, 65 Ocean Avenue, Los Angeles. Is that right? Yes, yes, that's right. He's my brother. Yeah, and your name is... Uh... Uh, Martin Jones. Huh? 1635 Sherwood Road, Riverdale, New York. Jones, Sherwood Road, Riverdale. All right, Mr. Jones, now let's see. That'll be $18. Oh, well, here's, uh, here's 20 Keep the change. Oh, uh, thanks, thanks, Mr. Jones. Uh, here's your receipt. It'll go out right away. Uh, there's a truck leaving tonight. Don't you worry. This trunk will get to Los Angeles all right. That's fine, fine. It'll be quite a load off my mind when it's gone. A week passed, two weeks, three, and poor Albert was breathing more easily again. 
until one morning when something most unexpected happened. Louise? Louise, darling. Yes, Albert. Oh, darling, I have a present for you. Some flowers. <laughs> Just saw them and thought you'd like them. Thank you, Albert. You're very thoughtful. Louise, your mother's been missing more than a month now. You can't go on like this. You'll have a breakdown. Oh, well, but where can she be? Why can't the police find her? Well, darling, if she hasn't been found in five weeks... Oh, excuse me, dear, I'll answer it. Maybe it's news of Mother, Albert. Uh, good evening. I got a trunk here I, I think belongs to you. A trunk? Yeah, hey, that's right. You always wanted to get rid of me, Albert. But I've come back, Albert. I've come back. Do you recognize it? It's yours, isn't it? Oh, no, no. Huh? Well, uh, ain't you the fellow that shipped this trunk about a month ago? Did, didn't you give me a $2 tip? I'm afraid you have me confused with someone else. Don't you know where the trunk goes? Well, no. You see, it's come all the way back from California. It, it seems there wasn't uh, no such address where this was shipped to. Surely, surely it had a return address. Uh, yeah, but the trunk got wet. Uh, uh, the return address kind of washed off, so it came back to the office where it was shipped from. Oh, but what makes you think it belongs here? Well, you see, I kind of did a little detective work. The uh, initials stamped on the trunk are H.G.M. Well, I looked it up in the phone book, and the only person in town with those initials lives here. Well, I'm sorry, but it, it certainly isn't my trunk. Oh, well, I'm sorry to trouble you. I, I'd have sworn you was the guy that gave me that two-buck tip. Uh, where will you take the trunk now? Oh, it'll be put to the unclaimed baggage, uh, and then in a few months it'll be auctioned off. Auctioned off? Yeah. You'd be surprised what you sometimes find in them, just like a grab bag game. Well, sorry to trouble you. Oh, wait a minute. Huh? Uh, what did you say those initials were? Uh, H.G.M. H.G.M. What? Uh, they're, they're, they're my mother-in-law's initials. Her name is, is Hortense G. Murdoch. Well, sure. That, that was the only name in the book with those initials. That's why I came here. Well, that was a very clever piece of detective work. Uh, yes, of course it's her trunk. <laughs> I don't know why I didn't recognize it. Well, you know, trunks, they kind of look alike. <laughs> yes, yes, that's right. Well, bring it in. Trunks are funny things, aren't they? You have something valuable in one, and just as likely as not, it'll get lost. But put something you don't want in it. Uh, like a mother-in-law, and it'll come back every time. You can hardly blame Albert for being upset, especially since Louise wanted to open the trunk to look for possible clues. But Albert managed to get Louise out of the house, then uh, put the trunk onto the trunk rack of his car and started out. Several hours later, he was at the receiving platform of an all-night storage warehouse in New York. Yes, mister? Can I help you? Pardon me, but you store uh, trunks here, don't you? Yeah, sure. We store anything in here. You want to store that trunk you got there? Oh, yes, please. Okay, I'll make out a ticket. Now, uh, what's your name? Williams. John Williams. The address? Uh, 313 Maple Street. Yeah, but what city, mister? What oh, city? Oh, uh, Baltimore, Maryland. Baltimore. Okay. Charge is $3 a month. How long you want to pay for? Oh, quite a while. Uh, I'll be leaving the country and... Uh... Well, what is it? Anything wrong, mister? Oh, dear, I... I only seem to have six dollars with me. Well, that'll pay for two months. Then we'll send you a bill. No, that won't be necessary. I'll send you a money order in a few days. I may be out of the country for several years. Okay. Leave the trunk there. I'll take care of it. And uh, here's your receipt. Just put the number of it in your letter when you send the money. I will. I, I won't forget. Good night. Good night. Hey, Mr. Williams. Mr. Uh, he's gone. There's a receipt on the platform where he dropped it. Hmm. The nervous type. Oh, well, I suppose they can forward it to him from Baltimore. When Albert found he'd lost his receipt for the trunk, he was badly upset at first. That meant he couldn't send any money for future storage charges. But after all, there was no identification inside it, and he'd rubbed Mother's initials off the outside this time. So how could anyone trace it back to him? Especially since they'd be looking for him in Baltimore. So in a few weeks, Albert was himself again. Except for a nightmare once in a while. 
After all, <laughs> what do I know about you, Albert? Mm. You may have criminal tendencies, and I'm going to protect my daughter from you. Yes, I've come back, and you're not mm. going to get rid of me. Do you hear me, Albert? I've come back to stay. Oh, no. Leave me alone. Leave me alone. I can't. Albert. No. Albert, wake up. Oh, what is it, Louise? You were moaning in your sleep, dear. You must have been having a nightmare. Oh, oh yes, I was. But it's not important. It, just that midnight snack I had. Go back to sleep, darling. <laughs> But as the months passed, so did the nightmares. And finally, Albert was his old cheerful self again. Good evening, dear. How are you? I'm all right, Albert. Fine, fine. Say, I bumped into George Horton and his wife while on the way home, and they asked us to come to the charity bazaar tonight. That was very nice of them, Albert. Oh, well, why don't we go? There'll be an auction, a raffle, supper, dancing. It'll do you good. I know, but somehow I don't feel like meeting people. But you can't go on this way, Louise, cutting yourself off from the world. I've been unfair to you, haven't I, Albert? Keeping you home night after night all these months. Oh, why, darling, you know I've been perfectly happy. It's been so nice. Just the two of us. You've been perfectly wonderful, Albert. And I'm afraid I've been acting very selfishly. All right, I'll go to that charity affair tonight. Do I hear, Dollar? Do I hear, Dollar? I'll get a dollar. Ah, oh, there we have a lady with a real sense of beauty. Now, do I hear from Dollar? Do I hear from Dollar? Well, good evening, George. Well, hello, Albert. Hello, Louise. Hello, George. Gee, I'm sure glad you two came. Missed you both a lot these past months. Well, I hope you'll be seeing more of us. Hey, we've got quite a crowd here tonight. Oh, yeah. We hope to raise quite a bit of money. Say, that auctioneer's a genius. Come on, let's get a little closer. All right. Uh, now, uh, that gentleman over there, the one with the superb eye for beauty, bids five dollars for this lamp. Do I hear five fifty? Your last chance, ladies and gentlemen, going at five dollars once, going twice, sold to the gentleman in the tweed suit, and very fortunate he is. <laughs> that lamp couldn't have cost more than three dollars when it was new. <laughs> well, now we come to the raffle. The raffle? Yeah, the raffle for a mystery prize donated by yours truly, George Horton. Well. Oh. <laughs> Better let me sell you a few tickets, Albert. They're I'll... only 50 cents each. No, no, thanks, George. We just came to be sociable. Better take a chance. No telling what you might win. Now, uh, next, ladies and gentlemen, we come to the feature of the evening. A raffle for a mystery prize, which I have hidden here beneath this canvas cover. Now, I'm going to lift this cover and show you a locked trunk. Now, take a good look at it. The trunk? Oh, no. It can't be. She's come back again. Yes, Albert, I've come back. And I'm going to stay for good this time. Oh, no, no. Now, this is no ordinary trunk, ladies and gentlemen. It was donated by a gentleman who bought it for storage charges. Now, who knows what it contains? Perhaps the crown jewels of old Russia. Or better still, uh, a case of scum. <laughs> <laughs> now, take a good look at it and try to get Albert, you're so pale. Is there anything wrong? I know, of course not. George, where did you get this trunk? Oh, that big storage place in New York. You know, on the east side. Somebody did keep up the storage charges on it, and all the notifications they mailed came back, yes. so... Yes, I see. Now that you've seen all the prizes, and particularly seen this prize, ladies and gentlemen, I know you're going to want to buy not one, not two, but half a dozen chances each. What can be in it? Guessing is half the fun. Well, now we're all going to adjourn for supper, and immediately after supper, the big drawing will be held. So buy your chances now and win yourself a trunk full of surprise and pleasure. Well, Albert, changed your mind about buying a chance or two? Yes, George, yes, I have. I'll take all you've got. Albert, I don't understand you. You've bought every chance that was left on that trunk. Louise, I know what I'm doing. What on earth do you want with an old trunk that... 
looks a lot like Mother's trunk, doesn't it? Oh, no, no, I don't think so. But of course it does, Albert. It's the same make and color. It has the same dent there. But it couldn't be. Of course not. <laughs> the idea is absurd. Darling, you, you're acting so strangely. You didn't eat any supper, oh, and now you... For heaven's Louise, will you stop nagging me? I'm sorry, Albert. Hello, hello. <laughs> Feeling pretty sure you're going to win it with all those tickets, huh, Albert? I hope so. I knew the mystery of it would get you. Say, I've even got a ticket on it myself. So you'll have some competition. Oh, I'll win it. I've got to. Well, I did my best. I picked out the heaviest trunk the place had for sale. So I don't want the winner to blame me if he doesn't like what he finds. And uh, now, ladies and gentlemen, we are ready for the feature of the evening, the drawing for the locked mystery truck. Now, my assistant has put all the ticket stubs in the wire wheel, and so I spin it thus. Round and round it goes, and where it stops, nobody knows. <laughs> now, the stubs are thoroughly mixed, and I stop the wheel so that this lovely young lady may reach in and withdraw the number of the lucky, lucky winner. Now, will you open your eyes, please, and read the number that you have drawn? Number, number 38. Number 38. Number 38. Number 38 is the winner. Is the holder of number 38 here, please? Yes, yes, I have it. I've won. I've won. Well, good for you, Albert. Congratulations, sir. May I have your ticket, please, so that I may compare it with the stub that the young lady drew? Yes, yes, of course. Here it is. Thank you. Now, I place the ticket and the stub together, and we... What is it? I'm very sorry. I'm afraid an error has occurred. An error? What do you mean? Uh, the young lady misrep uh, she misread the winning number. It is number 33, not 38. No. Oh, you're lying. I won. Is the trunk's mine. Uh, now, I'm sorry, but mistakes will happen. Ladies, ladies and gentlemen, I must make a correction. The winning number is 33. Is the holder of number 33 present? Oh, yes, yes. Well, that's my number. Well, hard luck, Albert. But I guess you don't win after all. Uh, now, may I, uh, may I have your ticket, please? Yeah, sure, here, here. Thank you very much. Uh, now, ladies and gentlemen, the lucky winner, purely by chance, is the gentleman who donated the prize, Mr. George Horton. And congratulations to you, sir. <laughs> and I hope you'll open the trunk now and let the rest of us know what we missed out on. I certainly will. No, he, he can't open it. You haven't got the key. No, no, but I have a bunch here that I borrowed from a locksmith, and one of them's bound to work. But you mustn't open it. George, George, I'll buy that trunk from you. Well, I don't want to sell. Hey, uh, I want to know what's in the trunk. That's where the fun comes in. I'll give you $100. You can't refuse. A hundred? Well, if you want it that bad, all right. I'll give you my check tomorrow. Yeah, but there's one condition. Condition? Yep. That you open the trunk here so we can all see what's in it. Oh, no, I won't do it. Well, then the deal's off. Sorry, Albert, but curiosity has the better of it. Oh, come on. George, <laughs> George, please listen to sorry, me. Sorry, Albert, sorry. Uh, just a minute, everybody. As soon as I find one of these keys at bed, I'll... Oh, do do I come back, Albert? And I have. Oh. You should have known I would. Oh, no, no. Darling, you're not well. Let's go home. No, it's no use. It, it's just no use. What on earth do you mean? You will never be rid of me, Albert. Never. I've come back to stay. I think I've got it. Yeah, this key's going to be turning. No, wait. Wait. Uh, what is it? You mustn't open it. Oh, Albert, fun's fun, but no, after I, all... I had something to tell you. She's beaten me. I, I can't keep it hidden any longer. That's right, Albert. Tell them. It's the only way you can ever be rid of me. Go on. Tell them. Well, Albert? I... I did it. I killed her. Did what? Killed who? Oh, Albert, what are you talking about? I killed Louise's mother. Her body is in that trunk. Oh, no. Albert, that's a very poor joke. Oh, it's no joke. I thought I could get rid of her, but I can't. She keeps coming back and coming back and coming back. And I can't stand it any longer. Go on, open the trunk now. You'll see I'm telling the truth. Go on, open it. All right, we will. Uh, please stand back, everybody. Come on, stand back, all of you. Yes, Auctioneer, help me, will you? Yes, sure, Mr. Horton. I'll undo this catch now. There. All right, now lift her. Albert, this trunk. Why, well, there's nothing in it but old books. <laughs> Mr. 
This is the mysterious traveler again. Poor Albert. He let himself be fooled by the wrong trunk. Maybe it was his guilty conscience. What happened to him? Why, he's getting the best of attention these days in a small but comfortable room with bars over the windows. The only trouble is the bars won't keep his mother-in-law out. She comes in every night to talk to him. So if you're ever tempted to... Oh, you're getting off here. I'm sorry. But I'm sure we'll meet again. I take this same train every week at this time. You've just heard The Mysterious Traveler, a series of dramas of the strange and terrifying. Listen next week over most of these mutual stations to a tale titled Murder is No Accident. Another tale of The Mysterious Traveler. The Mysterious Traveler is presented by the Mutual Network from our New York studios. Russ Dunbar speaking. Stay tuned to this station for another exciting crime drama. True Detective Mysteries, which immediately follows station identification. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Mutual presents The Mysterious Traveler. This is The Mysterious Traveler, inviting you to join me on another journey into the realm of the strange and the terrifying. I hope that you enjoy the trip, that it thrills you a little and chills you a little. So settle back, get a good grip on your nerves, and be comfortable, if you can. Tonight, we're going to join Bill Storm, a newspaper reporter, on the strangest manhunt ever conducted, or should I say woman hunt, as he searches frantically through a great city for the most dangerous and deadly woman you've ever imagined. In the story I call, The Woman in Black. And now here is the story as Bill Storm himself wrote it down uh, when he began to be afraid that maybe he was going to succeed in his hunt for the woman in black. My name is Bill Storm. I'm a newspaper reporter. And I'm writing this because I have a date tonight. A date with a gorgeous brunette with big dark eyes and the smoothest, softest voice in the world. <laughs> Sounds nice, doesn't it? Well, I'd like to believe she's nice, but I can't. In my heart, I know she's the most dangerous woman in the world. Up to a week ago, I'd never even heard of her. A week ago, the day of Rusty Dean's funeral. You know, the, the big shot, gambling, slot machines. Killed by a solitary gunman while stepping out of his nightclub. They didn't catch the killer, but they gave Rusty the biggest funeral since Prohibition. I was on the rewrite desk that afternoon... My best friend, Tom Jervis, was covering the funeral. And along about four, he phoned in. First, he gave me all the dope on the funeral, and then he started telling me about some brunette he just met. <laughs> he was always a sucker for brunettes. Bill, she's a knockout. Big black eyes and the smoothest, softest voice in the world. I want you to meet her. Oh, blonde's more my style, Tom. Anyway, you're supposed to be working. Or have you forgotten? I am working. Listen, Bill, I've got a front-page story here. Theda led me to it. Who did? Theta, that's her. T-H-E-D-A, Theta. Just like Theta Bear, the old silent picture star. Oh. Well, uh, this is how it happened, Bill. I was watching the crowd at Rusty's funeral. I spotted a trim little number all in black, uh, whispering to Joe Nelson. Well, who's Nelson? Joe Nelson, a small-time thug. Well, anyway, she moved off. I thought she might be a relative of the deceased, so I asked Joe about her. He claimed he'd never seen her before. That all that she'd said to him was, four o'clock at the Banner Bar and Grill. Four o'clock at the Banner Bar and Grill? Sounds like a message. That's what Joe figured. Only decided that she'd delivered it to the wrong guy. 
Well, I uh, sort of wanted to see her again, so I persuaded Nelson he needed a drink. We slipped around the corner here to the Banner Bar and Grill. Sure enough, she was here waiting for us. Now, Tom, watch yourself. Well, you've got the wrong idea. She's a perfect lady. <laughs> yeah? What about that big story you claim you had? I'm coming to it. But honest, Bill, I want you to meet Theta. You'll go for her. Hey, look, look, I'm going to put her on the phone to say hello. Here she is. Uh, uh, Theta? Hello, Bill Storm. Hello, Theta. Is that your real name? Yes. Don't you like it, Bill? Well, sure, I like it. What's the rest of it? Any girl my sidekick goes overboard for, I'd, I'd, I'd like to know her name. There isn't any rest of it, Bill. Just Theta. Oh, nobody is just one name. Not these days. Sorry, Bill. It's all I've ever had. Here's Tom again. Uh, listen, listen, Bill, I'm going to fix up a date with her for you. But here's the story that I promised you. Joe uh, Nelson has been getting quietly plastered. And from what he's let slip, I'm positive he's the gunman who killed Rusty Dean. He is? Well, then hang on to him. I am. You get a car, come down here. We'll smuggle him up to the office and work on him. Maybe we can get the whole story out of him. I'll be there in 15 minutes. Keep buying him drinks till I get there. Uh, what's the address? Uh, it's, uh, it's on the corner of Fifth and Spruce. Bill, two men just came in the door. They got Tommy guns. They're after Joe Nelson. Tom, what happened? They just mowed him down. Theta's gone. She slipped away when they came in. I think she fingered him for them. Yeah, yeah, that explains everything. Uh, Bill, they're coming over toward this phone booth. They're going to shoot. Bill! Tom! Tom! Bill. Bill, they've got me. But find that girl. She knows who they are. She's working with them. So, so long, Bill. <laughs> I was there in five minutes, even before the police got there. The place was deserted, except for the two dead men. Joe Nelson, the gunman, and Tom. Tom, my best friend, led to his death by a Delilah in a black dress. Well, the police didn't find the gunman who did the shooting, so I set out to find the girl, to track them down through her. Once I found her, she was going to talk plenty. I began the hunt by calling on the man who had been Rusty Dean's chief lieutenant and was running his enterprises now. Nick Murray. Sit down, Storm. You said you wanted to talk to me. What about? Murray, did your boys kill Joe Nelson this afternoon? My boys? No, Bill. Why should they? Maybe because it was Nelson who bumped off Rusty Dean. He did? How do you know that? You mean you didn't know it? Listen, if I'd known that Nelson would have been dead long before this. <laughs> I figured that. That's what made me think that you were in the clear. You haven't told me how you know Nelson killed Rusty. Well, he had a few drinks this afternoon. He let it slip out to Tom Jervis, my sidekick. Just before those two hoodlums riddled them both. A brunette named Theda put Nelson and Tom on the spot for them. A brunette named Theda? I've never heard of her. Oh, I hoped you might have. A good figure. Deep, dark eyes, low, soft voice. Looks like a lady. <laughs> Some lady if she works with a bump-off gang. No, I never heard of her. But if she's working with any local mob, I'll hear about her all right. If any of my boys run across her, I'll let you know. Thanks, Murray. But warn them. If they meet her, watch out. She's pure dynamite. Well, that was one lead that got me no place. So next, I dropped in on Captain Hughes, the head of homicide, to ask if the police had gotten any fingerprints off the glass the girl had been drinking from before the shooting started. Sorry, Bill. No dice. You mean you, you didn't get anything from the girl's glass? Not a thing. You see, she hadn't touched it. None of the liquor was gone. Well, now, that proves that she wasn't on the level. Not necessarily, but uh, well, I've issued orders to have her picked up if she's found. Not much to go on, though. We tried to get a description from Gomez, the waiter who served them, but... Uh, but what? Well, he says he didn't get a good look at her. When she slipped away, he didn't even see her go. Some eyes he must have had. I suppose he didn't even see the shooting. Not much of it. He dived down the cellar steps when it started. He's in uh, Civic Hospital now. Well, I'm going out there to talk to him. He must have noticed something. Oh, and uh, so long, Captain, and thanks. It wasn't much of a lead, but it was all I had. It was pretty late by now, and when I got there, the hospital had settled down for the night. They put Gomez in a ward... And outside the ward, I found a nurse on duty. The blonde kid who, who turned as I came up. 
Oh, good evening. You looking for someone? Yes, my name is Storm. I'm looking for a patient named Gomez. Gomez? Oh, yes, broken arm and internal injuries. Uh, how is he? Is he awake? Yes. He's feeling badly, complains of pains in his chest. Well, if he's awake, I want to talk to him. Uh, this is police business. What bed's he in? The last one, down by the far door. But I'll have to ask the doctor if you can see him. Uh, will you wait here? She disappeared down the hall, but I didn't wait. The ward was dark, except for a couple of dim lights. I started for the far end, and... Then I saw her. She was just a figure in a black dress, bending over the last bed. But it was Theta, all right. It had to be. I tiptoed down the room. She was talking to Gomez, and he was moaning a little. It hurts, doesn't it, Gomez? Yes, of course it does. But it'll go away soon. He mumbled something, and then he reached for the glass on the table beside his bed. A drink of water? Of course. Let me help you. She helped him lift the glass to his lips, and then I knew what she was up to when I yelled, Gomez, drop that glass. Don't drink out of it. He dropped it all right, but it was too late. He'd already drunk from it. He turned to stare at me, his mouth open, and she moved toward the door right beside her. I ran after her, but it was too late. When I reached it, she was gone, swallowed up in a dark hall. I knew it wasn't any use hunting for her, and I turned back to Gomez. In my impatience, I grabbed his shoulder. Gomez, who was she? What did she want? Mr. Storm, you're not supposed to be in here. What are you doing to my patient? I'm going to make him answer Take me. Take your hands off him. He's not going to answer any questions for you tonight. And I say yes. I'm afraid not, Mr. Storm. He's dead. Yes. He was dead, all right. The only possible witness who could have led me to her and she eliminated him. And then I knew that whoever she was and whatever her game was, trying to find her was going to be about as safe as moving into a den of rattlesnakes. I put in a bad night trying to figure it all out. Next morning when I got down to the paper, my eyes looking like two holes burning a bladder, I handed up my editor, Harry Holloway, in the city room. Well, well, look at Frankenstein. What happened to you, Bill? Oh, I'm all right, Harry. Listen, anything new come in about those thugs who killed Tom? Not a thing. Papers needling the police, but, well, so far, no results. And there won't be either, until we find that girl in black. She's the key to the whole thing, I know it. Aren't you getting a little hipped about that girl in black? After all, she may be perfectly innocent. Oh, yeah? Then how do you explain her killing Gomez last night, just before I could question him? Bill, are you sure you didn't imagine you saw her at the hospital? After all, nobody else did. Not even the nurse. Imagine it. I heard her talking to him. In a soft, honey voice, as if she was bringing him flowers instead of poison. Yeah, that's another thing. The hospital autopsy in Gomez found no trace of poison. They claim it was internal hemorrhage and shock that killed him. Sure, the shock of a nice, healthy slug of poison in his glass of water. Suppose they didn't find anything. They weren't looking for it, that's all. Harry, look, I saw her kill her. Okay, okay, you saw her. Now what? I want to be relieved of all assignments until I find her, that's what. She's in this city, and I'll run her down inside a week. Or I'll quit calling myself a reporter. A week, I said. It didn't take any week to find her. Not that girl. She got around too much. I saw her again just one hour later. It happened like this. I went back to my apartment, and I dropped into a chair beside my window. And I started trying to figure my next move. Now, I have an inside room, and the window looks right out on another building across an air shaft, not ten feet away. I've been sitting there about half an hour when, out of the corner of my eye, I saw someone in the room directly across from me come to the window and stand there, looking over at me. It was a girl in a black dress, wearing a cute little hat with a black veil down over her eyes. And as soon as I saw her, I knew it was Theta. Don't ask me how I knew. I just did Standing there with a ten-foot air shaft separating us. Well, I did what I could. I turned so that she couldn't see what I was doing, and I got Captain Hughes on the phone. He said that he'd have the building surrounded if I could keep her talking for five minutes. Well, I hung up the phone, and I turned back toward the window, trying to act casual. Hello, Theta. Looking for me? Hello, Bill. No, it's just accidental that I'm here. But you're looking for me, aren't you? Her voice did something to me. 
I can't explain it. It sounds crazy for a hard-boiled crime reporter to say, but it seemed to get down inside me and twist things all around. Well, a minute ago, I had hated her. And, and now... Well, now I knew why Tom had gone overboard about her. I said something, anything to keep her talking. Why, yeah, Theda, I've been looking for you. <laughs> You're a hard girl to find. I have to be, Bill. But why, Theda? Look, you're just a kid. What kind of a racket are you mixed up in, anyway? I'm sorry, Bill. I can't answer that. But listen, you, you could be anything you wanted. You don't have to be mixed up with murder. Then you think I'm a murderer? Oh, what else can I think? Last night you killed that poor devil at the hospital. I saw you. Yes, I know. You wouldn't believe me if I told you you're wrong, would you? Oh, I'd like to, Theda, but I can't. I can't. I'm sorry, Bill. Someday you'll know the truth. Now I have to go. Oh, no, wait. Let me look at you. I think we met someplace before. Yeah, it, it was Chicago. I, I can't remember where. Please don't try to, Bill. And don't try to find me anymore. Now, goodbye. Oh, no, wait. But she was gone. And then somebody else appeared at the window. A window washer. He started to climb out on the sill to fasten his belt to the safety hooks, and I yelled at him, Hey, you! Uh, th that girl who was there, stop her! You made a little number in the black dress? Yeah, where did she go? Uh, she went out just as I come in, but... Well, go after her, grab her, she's wanted by the police. Hey, listen, mister, I'm here to watch windows, not to chase dames. If the police want to let them catch her. That's what bothering me, I got a job to do. Hey, look out! Huh? Your safety hook! No! Ah! Right in front of my eyes, he fell 15 floors. I saw the safety hooks break as he leaned his weight against them. And then I knew why she'd been there. She'd been there to weaken those hooks to make sure that poor devil fell and killed himself. Well, Storm, we didn't get her. She slipped through our fingers somehow. But she was there, Captain. I saw her. I talked to her. Oh, she was there, all right. We found a handkerchief in the room, a woman's handkerchief. Initial J on it. Heavy perfume. Here it is. Lilac. It's drenched in lilac. Uh, but look, the initial's J. She said her name was Theta. She was kidding you. But she did the job all right. Those safety hooks had been filed away to nothing. One of the local mobs is trying to get control of the window washers union. That's why she was killed. Intimidation. Sweet little lady, that one. Hey, but Storm, the elevator boy who took her up says she was a blonde. No, not a brunette. He was crazy. Her hair's as black and soft as midnight. Getting poetic, aren't you? I wonder if you're still as anxious to find that girl as you were. What? Of course I am. Yeah? And when I find her, she'll get what's coming to her. That's what I said. I didn't know for sure whether I meant it or not. I just knew that I had to find her again. For four days, I combed the town for that girl. And then, uh, two nights ago, as I was walking home, just about midnight, I ran into Dutton, a cop I knew, looking down the dark street and scratching his head. Hello, Dutton. What's the matter? You see a ghost? Oh, hello, Mr. Storm. No, but I got a funny feeling. I just saw that girl Captain Hughes once picked up. You did? Where? When? Uh, just a minute ago. I was walking my beat when this dame comes past me, all dressed in black. And she smiles at me. Yeah, go on. What happened then? Where'd she go? Uh, down the street. She turned into that door down there. Well, come on, then. If she's still there, we got to get her. In 30 seconds, we were standing before the dark door that Dutton said the girl had turned into. It was partly open. That's the door, Mr. Storm. But that's the entrance to a first storage loft. Why would she go in there? I don't know, but we'll find out. Well, better let me go first. I got a gun here. I'll see what's going on inside. He pushed the door open. Step into the dark hall. And then I heard him call out. Hey, lady, I want to talk to you. I... Hey, you up there. Put down that fire. Put it down. Oh, oh. Dutton. Dutton. Who shot you? Was it the girl? No. no. She was just standing there. It was two guys upstairs. I... I Jack and the furs. They... They... Oh, Dutton. Dutton. <laughs> Dutton. 
But listen, Storm, you say you didn't see her. Then how do you know it was the same girl? I know, Captain Hughes. She was acting as a lookout for those fur thieves. She deliberately lured him in there to his death. Maybe, or maybe not. I'm seriously beginning to doubt if it's the same girl mixed up in all these cases. I think it's just a theory. Your theory. I'll prove it to you. She's definitely mixed up in these rackets. And by now, Nick Murray and his boys must have learned something about her. I'm going over there now and find out. When I got to Murray's club, one of the boys showed me up to the office. Hello, Storm. Come in and sit down. Thanks. I will. Can I fix you a drink? No. No, thanks. No? I just wondered if you'd picked up any trace of that girl I was asking you about. Peter? No, the boys haven't turned up a thing. Look, are you sure you're not just imagining her? <laughs> That's what the police are beginning to think, too. But I'm not, Nick. She's real, all right. Listen, if there was any such girl working in this man's town, I'd know about her by now. Unless she's awful smart. And it looks like this one is. Oh, well, I guess I'd better go and get some sleep. I need it. Oh, uh, before you go... Yeah? I don't know anything about the girl, but tomorrow I may be able to tell you who killed your sidekick, Tom Jervis. You may? Yeah. When? Well, I won't have the dope until tomorrow night. If you'll meet me around 10, I can give it to you. I'll meet you. Just say where. You know the tambourine bar on 3rd Avenue? No, but I'll find it. Okay, there's a back room. Meet me there about 10. And come alone. About 10? Right. I'll be there. <laughs> I didn't get much sleep. I was too keyed up. About three, I got up and I put on a dressing gown. I sat down by the window to smoke. And then, behind me... Hello, Bill Storm. I turned, and she was there, standing in the doorway. I started to get up, No, but... stay where you are, Bill. Unless you do, I'll leave. Theda, why have you come here? You've been looking for me so hard, Bill, I thought I ought to. Look, I won't touch you or, or try to make you stay, but... Let me get up and fix you a drink. I'm sorry, Bill. I can't stay. But I did want to tell you... the time has come when you can know the truth about me. You mean you're going to tell me who you are? And why you've done what you did? Everything, Bill. But not tonight. I'll see you again tomorrow, though. When? Where? You have an appointment, don't you, with Nick Murray at 10 o'clock? Oh, well, yeah. At the Tambourine Bar. How do you know? Are you working for him? No, Bill, I'm not. I don't work with anyone. Yeah, but Theda... Please don't ask me any questions now. I can't tell you anything until tomorrow night. Good night, Bill. Oh, no, wait. You can't go yet. But she was gone. By the time I reached the door, she was out of sight. So I went back to bed, but I didn't get any sleep. I was groggy, punch drunk. I knew she was guilty, but... I wanted to believe she was innocent. Well, now I'm going to learn the truth. I'm waiting in the back room of the tambourine bar. It's almost ten. And I'm just finishing this report that I started this morning. She should be here soon. So should Nick Murray. If what she tells me satisfies me that she's innocent, I'll tear this up. But if she isn't... Well, I'm going to find out because she's coming through the door now. Hello, Bill. Hello, Theda. You did come, didn't you? Of course I came, Bill. You believe bad things about me, don't you? Oh, yes. How can I help it? Believe me, Bill, I'm not wicked. Look at me and see if you really think I'm bad. She lifted her veil then. And for the first time, I saw her face clearly. It was just as I thought it would be. A beautiful face with dark eyes that I could see into the deeper and deeper, like looking into the heart of the night itself. Now, Bill, do you really think I'm wicked? Oh, no. No, I don't. I've been wrong. But who are you, then? What's your connection with these murders? You'll know in a moment, Bill. I have to leave you, just for a minute or two. Just while you talk to Murray. He's coming now. She slipped out one door while Murray came in the other. Nick closed the door behind him and sat down. Well, I see you're on time, Storm. Yes. If you can tell me who killed Tom Jervis, I want to know. That's what I'm here for. Two of my boys killed him. What? Two of your boys? That's right. You see, Joe Nelson killed Rusty Dean on my orders, so I could take over. 
Then I saw your friend trying to pump Joe. I couldn't very well afford to take chances. I had to get rid of both of them. I see. That explains a lot. What about the girl? I don't know a thing about her. I think you just made her up as an excuse to come asking me questions. Oh, no. No, I didn't. She's real. I know better. Because you did see a girl in that apartment where the window washer fell, but not a girl in black. You saw Janice, my girl. She filed those safety hooks. Dropped that handkerchief the police found. She did? You mean you had that fellow killed? Yes, Storm. Just a little business deal I'm interested in. And last night I decided you were getting to be a nuisance. That's why I'm telling you all this now. Because you're not going to pass it on. Oh, no. No, put that gun away. You can't get away with it. You... Goodbye, Storm. We won't be meeting again. Theda. Theda. Here I am, Bill. Theda, help me. Call a doctor. I'm sorry, Bill. I can't. But it won't hurt long. Theda. Yes, Bill. But I recognize you now. I know where I saw you that time in Chicago. Yes, Bill. I knew you'd remember. Oh, no. No, stay away from me. Bill, don't be afraid of me. Oh, no. Stay away from me. Stay away. Bill, come back. You mustn't run away from me. Come back. Come back. No. No, I won't. I won't. You're not going to get me like you did the others. Mr. Storm. Mr. Storm, can you hear me? Where am I? You're a nurse. Yes. You're in Civic Hospital. You were brought here an hour ago, shot in the chest. You were found crawling down 3rd Avenue by a policeman. Oh, yeah. yeah I remember. Nurse, take this down. Nick Murray shot me. What? Get word to the morning ledger. Certainly, Mr. Storm. Now, please lie quietly while I get the doctor. I'll only be a minute. Hello, Bill. Hello, Theda. You followed me here. Yes. You shouldn't have run away, Bill. I did it because... I remembered where I saw you last. In Chicago. The time I was in a taxi accident. I saw you in the other car. Just before we hit... Three people were killed. That's right, Bill. You did see me then. And now you know who I am. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Now I understand why you have to be around when people die. You don't kill them. It's just your job to be there. But I... I never expected you to be a beautiful girl. Why not, Bill? Just because people think of me as an ugly old man with a scythe, does that make it true? I'm not really ugly, you know. I'm not someone you have to be afraid of. Oh, no. And I'm glad you're beautiful. Makes it easier this way. Now take my hand, Bill. It's time for us to go. Yeah, sure. I'm ready. He recovered consciousness a minute ago, Dr. Clark. I came for you at once. He seemed to be quite strong, and I... Doctor! Dr. Clark! He's dead! This is the mysterious traveler again. So that was the secret of the girl in black. Theda, a strange name. T-H-E-D-A. I wonder if Bill ever did realize that those are the same letters that spell death. But he did what he set out to do. He learned the truth, and he avenged his friend, and he... Oh, you have to get off here. I'm sorry. But I'm sure we'll meet again. 
I take this same train every week at this time. You have just heard The Mysterious Traveler, a series of dramas of the strange and terrifying. In tonight's cast were Maurice Tarplin, Chet Stratton, James Van Dyke, Wendell Holmes, Mort Lawrence, and Joan Tompkins. Original music was played by Jack Ward. The Mysterious Traveler is written, produced, and directed by Rob Arthur and David Cogan. Listen next week to a tale titled... Death Wears My Face. Another strange and shivery tale of The Mysterious Traveler. The Mysterious Traveler came to you from our New York studios. Carl Caruso speaking. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. presents The Mysterious Traveler. This is The Mysterious Traveler, inviting you to join me on another journey into the realm of the strange and the terrifying. I hope you will enjoy the trip, that it will thrill you a little and chill you a little. So settle back, get a good grip on your nerves, and be comfortable, if you can, for in a few moments, you're going to meet a ghost, the strangest phantom that you ever heard of. But first, I want you to be my guest on a little train ride. We're running at 60 miles an hour on open track in the dead of night. Now we thunder through a sleeping village. Then beyond it, we plunge into the waiting mouth of a tunnel. We race through the tunnel and into the open again. Over a trestle and on into the night. A little world of our own, rushing forward resistlessly, a symbol of power and speed and life. Yes, trains do have a life of their own, as you'll see in the unusual ghost story that I call... The Locomotive Ghost. My story starts some years ago in a hilly region of western Pennsylvania. It's almost midnight, and two men laden down with several handbags are moving cautiously over the rough ground beneath a railroad trestle. They come to a spot beneath one end of it, and there in the darkness, they stop and turn on a flashlight. All right, we can sit down and rest now. Are you sure this is the right spot? Of course I'm sure. This is the loading spur. It branches off at a mine entrance. Main line's over there, about 100 yards away. How, uh, how long do you think we'll have to wait? Five or ten minutes. These mine trains don't run in a minute the way they do out in the main line. Suppose uh, the money isn't on the mine train. They might have changed their plans. They'll be on it. Those miners are waiting for their pay, and the treasurer's bringing it himself. Plus bonus money and cash for operating the expenses. Big haul, my friend. $200,000. $200,000? That's a lot of dough, but... But what? You getting cold feet? No, no, of course not, but... Well, they'll be killed, won't they? The crew on the train? Forget it. I thought you were turning soft on me now after I spilled the whole plan to you. No, I'd... Joe, I'm not turning soft. Joe. What is it? Don't hear the noise, then. Over there. It's just your imagination. Oh, you're right. Somebody's coming. Keep the light steady. Got my gun handy. Who could it be? It's probably just a bum. He often sleep under his trestle. All right, you step where you are. It's only me, boys. Just old Boomer. Who? Old Boomer, that's all. Looking for a place to bunk. Howdy, boys. It's okay, Tom. I heard of this guy. So you're old Boomer, huh? The one they call the king of the bums? Uh, not the king, son. Just a traveling this one of them all. Fifty years I've been riding the rods, and I guess I've covered a million miles of track. Mind if I sit down here? Got a kind of ache in my bones. Sit down if you want to. Uh, thanks, son. Say, uh, you fellas ain't bums. You're dressed too good. Never mind about us. 
Curiosity ain't healthy. <laughs> Old Boomer never fights with anybody. Live and let live's his motto. Listen, here comes number 25. It's mighty fine train, 25. Got a 16-wheel Mikado engine, can pull 20 cars at 80 on a level track. She's uh, 50 seconds late tonight. Do you know every train on the tracks? Uh, pretty near, son, pretty near. I ain't rode them all. I rode them all, I mean, from the Lackawanna to the Santa Fe. There ain't much about trains I don't know. Say, uh, you fellas wouldn't have a little nip handy to take the chill out of an old man's bones. No, we ain't got a little nip handy. Oh, sure, son. No harm in asking. <laughs> yeah. There's the 25 passing Minesville now. Ain't that whistle far off in the night a sweet, mournful sound, though? Yeah, it is kind of mournful. Sounds are far off and ghostly, don't it? Well, sometimes it is a ghost you hear, not a real train at all. What are you talking about? I'm just saying that sometimes when you hear a train whistling far off and mournful in the night, it ain't a real train at all. It's a ghost train. Ghost train? It's a lot of hooey. Uh, you just think so because you're young and don't know better. But old Boomer can tell you there's ghost trains and plenty of them. They're the ghosts of trains that died in wrecks. Anything as live as a train is bound to have a ghost live on after All right, can the chatter. You're hurting my ears. Ah, let him talk, Joe. It helps pass the time. All right, but if you ask me, he's spotting a lot of bush water. Go on, Boomer. What were you saying about trains having ghosts? Well, I've seen them many a time. They're running the tracks with all the lights out, gone faster than the wind. Not a sound coming from them. I've seen the Heavenly Express, too, a couple times. What's the Heavenly Express? It's a special train, son. It's on the Earth to Heaven run. Travels a million miles a minute when it gets up speed. Takes a soldier railroad men from this world to the next. It always passes by when a wreck's gonna happen. That's enough talk. I'm sick of listening to you. All right, son. You don't believe me, but I know what I know. I can... Glory be. I hear it coming. I hear it coming now. Hear what coming? The Heavenly Express. It's coming down this track. Listen. I don't hear anything. There's nothing to hear. It's passing right by overhead. Now it's slower. It's going to stop. It's never stopped before. That, that means Rex's going to be here. Joe, he knows. That's it. That's what you hear for. You're going to wreck that mine train. Hear that, old man? That's a mine train turning into this spur. You're right, we're going to wreck it. No, you can't. You mustn't. But before we do, we got to take care of you. And this is how we're going to do it. <coughs> you shot him. I guess the Heavenly Express stopped for me, too. I sure hope so. But you fellas, it'll punish you. It'll follow you, sure as I'm laying here. Hello, follow us. What are you talking about? The judgment special. It punishes fellas that wreck trains on purpose. It runs any place has tracks. And it follows them until it gets them, one way or another. Because murdering a train is like murdering a man. you got to pay for it. And you'll pay for it. You think I'm crazy, but you'll see. You'll see. Yeah, that shut him up. Crazy old coot. I wish I hadn't killed him, Joe. Don't be a sap. Couldn't let him live to tell what he knew, could I? No, no, of course not. Listen, I hear the mine train coming. We just got time to get ready now. Put the suitcase with the dynamite against the trestle here. That's it. Now, come on, help me unroll a wire. Yeah, yeah, sure, Joe. Anything you say. That's it. Keep coming. All right. We gotta get plenty far away. Hear the train now? Yeah, I hear it. I can see the headlight, too. Look how bright it is. Okay, this is far enough. Take me just a second to hitch up the detonator. There it is. Now we're all ready. It's on the trestle now. Almost halfway across. What's the matter? You sound shaky. Listen, Tom, you're in this now, and it's too late to back out, you hear? Yeah, I know. It's, it's almost across. All right, then I'll close the detonator. Now. There she goes. Three hours later, the two men, Joe Malone and Tom Henderson, were driving eastward through the night, far from the scene of the train wreck. Between them on the seat was a large handbag, and Joe Malone at the wheel, 
patted it lovingly. Two hundred thousand bucks. Ha! You realize that, Tom? We got two hundred thousand bucks riding here between us. Yeah. Yeah, I know. What's the matter? You don't sound very happy about it. Sure I am. It's just... Just what? Well, I can't help remembering the crash when the mine train went to the ravine. The way the whistle kept screaming, just like the locomotive was something alive that was being killed. Oh, for Pete's sake, the whistle valve got stuck when the engine crashed, that's all. Sure, I know that, only... Well, I just can't help remembering it. Joe, the crew were all killed, weren't they? I suppose they were. What do you care? You're as nervous as an old woman. She should never have rung you in on this job. Oh, I'm all right, really, I am, Joe. Listen, uh, what are you going to do with your 100000 I'm heading for the big town. Going to have one swell time. Going to buy new clothes, stay at the best hotel in town, and really cut loose. Meet me in New York, I'll show you a real time. Where are you going to stay? Mrs. Miller's boarding house. It's over on the west side. You can find it in the phone book. Mm -hmm. I'm just staying there till I can buy some real classy duds. And I'm moving to Park Avenue. Always had a yen to live in Park Avenue. Now I'm going to see what it's like. Yeah, sounds all right. Maybe, uh... Joe, look out that train! What'd you do that for? Why'd you grab the brake? You stall us right here in the middle of a railroad crossing. Oh, I had to, Joe. The train on the track there in front of us, we almost ran into it. What are you talking about? There wasn't any train on that track. But there was, running without lights and not making a sound. You're crazy. I tell you, there wasn't anything in sight, not even a hand car. But I saw it, Joe. Never heard of a train running without lights. That proves you're crazy. Oh, well, maybe it was an empty. But if I hadn't stopped the car, we'd have smashed into the side of it. Yeah. Uh, I didn't mind to suck you one. Now we're stalling a railroad track, and the car won't... Start. I'll get out and push. Joe, look. A headlight. Real train this time. Coming around the bend. It's about 200 yards off. Joe, it's going to hit us. we got to jump. Yeah, but this door won't open. It's stuck. Come on, out this side. Come on, I got the bag. Oh, my coat's caught in the car door. I'm stuck. Help me. I can't, Joe. Jump. Jump. Help me, Tom. Help. Help me. Help. Mister? Mister, you all right? Yeah. Yeah, I'm all right. But my uh, friend, he must have been killed. Yes, he sure was. It's a wonder you get away and look at your car. Uh. There's pieces of it spread a quarter mile up the track. Whatever made you stop right there on the crossing? Car stall. Who are you? I I'm the crossing watchman. Watchman? Why weren't you on duty? Why didn't you signal there was a train coming? Because I didn't know it, mister. That was the wrecking train taking doctors down to Mineville. It was unscheduled. Oh, I see. What about the other train, the one that went past going east just before the wrecking train hit us? Other train? Yeah. Well, no other train due through here till 6 a.m. this morning. But I saw it, I tell you, traveling without lights. No train ever travels without lights. It's again the law. Say, are you drunk? No, no, I'm not. Where are you going? Listen, I got a, a report to make on this. You got to fill out a form. I get it. I'm not interested. Get away from here. I'm going to New York. Late the next afternoon, Tom Henderson reached New York. Not knowing where else to go, he hunted in the phone book for Mrs. Miller's boarding house that Joe Malone had mentioned and went there. Mrs. Miller gave him a room on the top floor. And there he carefully locked in the closet the precious handbag that held $200,000. All of it his since Joe's unfortunate death. After that, Tom went out to see New York's nightclubs. But he got back after midnight, feeling considerably more cheerful. As he was about to unlock his door, Mrs. Miller appeared in the hall. Oh, Mr. Henderson. Oh, Oh, yeah, Mrs. Miller. I was waiting for you, Mr. Henderson. Huh? It's turned so cool that I lit the gas heater in your room. Well, thanks a lot. I just wanted to warn you that you... What was that? What was what, Mr. Henderson? That, that whistle just now. What was it? A boat out in the river? Oh, that was a freight train, Mr. Henderson. A freight train? Here in the heart of New York? Well, yes. They come down the west side elevated tracks to the freight yard downtown. They run past just a few yards down the street. I didn't know that. I wouldn't have come here if I had... Oh, I'm sure they won't bother you, Mr. Henderson. Really, they won't. Well, good night. Good night. Oh, Badlax. 
be sure they won't bother me. And it's too late to find someplace else where I'd leave here right now. I'll close the window. There. I'll keep the sound out. Anyway, suppose I can hear a train or two. But I'm can hearing them do me. I'm gonna go to sleep and forget it. Yeah, forget it. I've got 200,000 bucks in my whole life ahead of me. <laughs> Should let an old coot like that boomer worry me. Joe's getting killed by a train was just an accident. Could happen to anybody. Me? I'm alive. Tomorrow, I'm gonna start enjoying it plenty. Son, we're leaving in one millionth of a second, and we got to be on time. Uh, Boomer, it's you. That's right, son. You got to wake up and get aboard. We're pulling out. Well, I'm at a railroad station someplace, but everything's so misty, I can't see much. No time for talking, son. Got to get aboard. Yeah, but I'm the only passenger, except for you and me, there isn't another soul in sight. And you're wearing a conductor's uniform. They promoted me. Now, come on, get aboard. I don't want to. I don't like trains. I don't want to go any place. Can't help it. This is a special trip just for you. And you got to be aboard. Had it. Come on now, up those steps. I... That's it. Now we're off right on time to the millionth of a second. Where, where are we going? What train is this? It's completely empty except for me and you. That's right, son. It's a thousand car train pulled by 30 engines. And you and me are the only ones aboard. Yeah, but where are we going? What, what train is this, anyway? It's the judgment special, son. And we're bound from this world to the next. No. No! Yeah, or any place there's tracks to judge up right outside your window and took you aboard. I don't want to die. I don't want to. You haven't any choice, son. You're on the judgment special, and we're hitting a million miles a minute now. What? Look out the window. There's the earth way down below us. See it? Yeah. But I don't want to leave it. I don't want to go. Look at the stars flash by. We're gone a million miles a minute, and it'll take us all eternity to get there. Yep. Here, I'll put the wind up so you can see better. Huh? There you are, son. There's the earth we left. That tiny little dot of light way up in the sky. No, I won't go with you. I won't. Hey, I won't. what are you doing? Get down. I you can't jump out that window. We're going a million miles a minute. I will jump. I'm not going with you. Come back. Come back. Wake up. Wake up, Mr. Henderson. Wake up. Wake up. Hey. What is it? Oh, what is it? Oh, Mr. Henderson, thank heaven you're still alive. I, I thought you were dead for sure. What? What happened? Well, you closed your window. I meant to warn you that with the gas heater on, you must leave it open. Well, you almost suffocated in your sleep. I... I almost suffocated? Yes. If I hadn't heard you trying to get your breath and hurried in and opened your window, you'd have been dead now, for sure. The rest of the night, Tom Henderson spent sitting on a bench in the nearest park, shivering at the nearness of his escape. The next day, he bought himself an expensive wardrobe, then he checked into the biggest hotel on Park Avenue. There, just before he retired, he, he took his sleeping tablet. Yeah, that fixed it. No dreams for me tonight. Ah, some layout. So this is what you can enjoy when you have money. And I'm going to enjoy it. I've been letting my nerves get the better of me. Not anymore. Feel better already. So out goes the light. I'm gonna sleep like a millionaire. Yes, just like a millionaire. And so Tom fell asleep. But unfortunately, he did dream. And he knew he was dreaming, but he couldn't wake up. 
It was a very curious dream indeed. He dreamed that he got up and dressed, rode down in the elevator, that he walked out into Park Avenue, and there, down the street, he found a tiny door which he entered. It led down a flight of steep iron stairs to a dark tunnel far beneath the ground. There in the tunnel, a man was waiting for him. The man turned, and he saw it was his former pal, Joe Malone. Hello, Tom. Joe. Joe, it's you. Yeah. I've been waiting for you, Tom. But... But you're dead. I saw you killed. Maybe I'm dead. Maybe I'm not. You're dead. I know it. It's just a dream. I gotta wake up. Can't wake up. Don't you understand? You're never gonna wake up. I will. I will. Oh, Tom. Now, come along with me. I'm here to guide you. Where? Where are you taking me? Down this tunnel. See how it stretches out? On and on. Now it keeps going down and down. No. Where do you think it goes to? I don't know. I don't, I don't want to know. Come on now, Tom. I can't wait all night. No, I won't go. I'm going to wake up. You can't, Tom. The night I was killed, you saw the judgment special. Now you can never get away from it. It's not true. This is... It's the dream. I'm safe in my own bed in the hotel. And you refuse to come with me? Yes, I do. I refuse. Listen, Tom. Listen to what? I don't hear anything. Listen. It's closer now. No. You hear that? That's the judgment special, Tom. Coming through this tunnel. Train. It's a train coming. And where are you going to go? You're in a tunnel, Tom. And no way out. It's, it's just a dream. It can't hurt me. It's coming closer, Tom. It's coming closer. No, it's only a dream. I gotta wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up, mister. Oh. Oh. Thank heavens I'm awake. I'd say not any too soon either. But... I... Who are you? So dark and... Carrying a lantern. Who am I, mister? I'm a track walker. Track walker? What do you mean? I mean that I inspect the track here under Park Avenue. What? How did I get here? Why, mister, a minute ago I found you walking in your sleep, your eyes tight closed down this tunnel right under Park Avenue. Park Avenue? If I hadn't met you, you never would open your eyes again, because number 10 is due along here in three minutes. Then... Then it wasn't a dream. I... I really am in a railroad tunnel. Yes, I am. I'll say you are. How you got here, I don't know, unless you came down one of the inspection doors from the street. But, brother, if this walking in your sleep is something you do often, take my advice and see a doctor. But Tom didn't go to a doctor, for he knew what a doctor would say. That it was his nerves, his guilty conscience. Now Tom felt he had to get away, far away to a place where there were no trains to haunt him. At dawn, he bought a ticket on the first plane leaving for Canada. That afternoon, he found himself in a tiny town deep in the heart of Canada. There, he hired a French-Canadian guide to take him by canoe far into the woods, away from any trace of civilization. Late that night, they arrived at the cabin where the guide lived with his wife. Tom unpacked his suitcase and joined the guide and his wife on the porch. For the first time since the wrecking of the mine train, Tom felt at peace. Oh, this is something like it. It is peaceful, is it not, monsieur? Yeah. Ah, monsieur's nerves are better already. Yes, this is what I need. Uh, how far is it to the nearest railroad? Oh, it is 80 miles, monsieur. 80 miles. Old Boomer said it traveled anywhere there were tracks. 80 miles ought to be enough. Pardon? I do not understand. Oh, uh, never mind. Uh, I've got to get some sleep now. Of course. Good night, monsieur. Good night, monsieur. What was that? Uh, what was what, monsieur? That, that whistle, then. It sounded like a train whistle. Impossible. It must have been an owl. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, sorry I bothered you. Good night. Tom entered his room and went to bed, but he could not sleep. He tossed and turned and at last got up and dressed. Oh, the moon is bright. I'll take a little walk. i got to calm myself down. There's nothing to worry about now, not a thing. Out here in the wilds, I'm safe. Perfectly safe. Tom left the cabin and entered the woods. They pressed thick around him, but an open passageway through the trees attracted Tom. He started down it, the moonlight illuminating his way. 
He paused and made a startling discovery. Why, I'm walking on old railroad ties. And there are tracks here, all rusted and loose. But the guide said there wasn't a railroad closer than 80 miles. He lied to me. He tricked me. A train. There's a train coming. It's coming toward me. There's a headlight. I gotta run. Run. Run! Marie! Marie! Qu'est-ce que c'est que ça, Pierre? The nearest one. He's not in the cabin. He has wandered off into the woods. Oh, that is strange. We must go after him. Hurry before he does himself an injury. It's still behind me. Still following me. I, I can't. I can't run anymore. I can't. I can't go any further. I gotta stop. I gotta stop. The judgment special, son. It runs any place there's tracks. And it follows you till it gets you. Because murder in a train is like murdering a man. You got to pay for it. You think I'm crazy, but you'll see. Here it comes, son. No! No! He cannot be far now, Marie. See his footprints. Ah, he was running for half a mile. He would do himself harm running so hard in his darkness. Look, Pierre. Voila. Yes, it is the nervous one. We have found him. He's lying face down. Wait, I will turn him over. Pierre, he lies so still. Has he done himself an injury? No, Marie. There is not a mark on him. Yet his face, it is twisted with fear. Pierre. Is he... is he dead? Yes, Marie, he is dead. His heart, he killed himself by running, no doubt. But what was it he ran away from? There is nothing dangerous in these woods. This is the mysterious traveler again. Poor Tom. The tracks he found himself on led to an abandoned logging camp. They hadn't been used in 20 years, and no train could possibly have run on them. Uh, except a ghost train. But of course, none of us believes in ghosts, so we just have to accept the coroner's verdict, which was heart failure induced by overexertion. Just the same, if you ever see a train running without lights and going faster than the wind, don't be too sure it's only your imagination. And next time you hear a distant, mournful whistle in the night, you... Oh, all this talk about trains is making you nervous and you have to get off here. I'm sorry. But I'm sure we'll meet again. Shall we say next week? at the same time. You have just heard The Mysterious Traveler, a series of dramas of the strange and terrifying. In today's cast were Maurice Tarplin, James McCallion, Joe Julian, Bryna Rayburn, and Cameron Andrews. Original music was played by Charles Paul. Mysterious Traveler is written, produced, and directed by Bob Arthur and David Cogan. Listen next week to a tale titled The Man the Insects Hated. Another strange and shivery tale of the Mysterious Traveler. 
The Mysterious Traveler has come to you from our New York studios. Carl Caruso speaking. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Mysterious Traveler. This is the Mysterious Traveler, inviting you to join me on another journey into the realm of the strange and the terrifying. I hope you will enjoy the trip, and it will thrill you a little and chill you a little. So settle back, get a good grip on your nerves, and be comfortable, if you can. Where are we going? Are we going to join Charles Foster as he takes an excursion into crime? I call the story, The Case of Charles Foster. Late one evening, several years ago, when I was practicing medicine in a large eastern city, I visited Charles Foster, a friend and patient of mine. I took with me Flush, a cocker spaniel he had entrusted to me. Hello, Doctor. I'm glad you were able to come. I see you brought Flush. Hello, Flush, old boy. He's missed you, Charles. I've missed him too, Doctor. It's been quite lonesome without him these past few months. Ah, uh, down, boy. It's a good dog. How do you feel, Charles? Oh, I'm all right, Doctor. You needn't worry about me. I'm glad to hear that. I suppose you've been quite puzzled about everything that's happened these past months. But frankly, Charles, I have. Even now, I find it difficult to believe that you could... Doctor, I'm going to tell you something that I've never told anyone. I thought I'd go to the grave with my secret, but... You know, we've always been friends, and I'd like you to know the truth. As you wish, Charles. Strange how little people know of one another. For ten years, Agatha and I were married, and to the outside world, we were a happily married couple. But in the privacy of our home, I found life with Agatha a nightmare. I never would have guessed that. For ten years, I stood her sharp tongue and constant nagging. I might have gone on taking it the rest of my life. Fate hadn't decreed otherwise. It was three years ago on a beautiful spring evening that fate stepped in change the entire course of my life. Is that you, Charles? Yes, Agatha. Did you remember to buy me some more of my cough medicine? Yes, here it is. Supper ready? Some men would be more interested in their wives' health than their own suppers. I'm sorry, Agatha, but you really don't look sick to me. That's because you don't care. I'm not well, and you know it. I work myself to death day in and day out, keeping this house clean. And little thanks do I get for I've it. I've told you before, Agatha, if the house is too much for you, hire a maid. And how exactly can we afford a maid on your miserable bookkeeper's salary? Well, if you can't manage it out of my salary, there's always the $50,000 your father left you. That money is mine, and I'm not spending a single cent of it. It's up to you to provide a maid. All right, Agatha. Please, let's not quarrel. Oh, hello, Flush. How are you, old boy? Oh, you care more about that dog than you do me. You know that isn't true. It is. Sometimes I think the only reason you come home is because of that dirty old dog. Quiet, Get away from me. All he does is eat and put his filthy paws on my furniture. I want you to get rid of that dog, Charles. Get rid of him? Yes. Buy some poison at the drugstore and dispose of him. You can't stand to see me have anything that makes me happy, can you? Well, I'm not getting rid of him. Charles, this is my house, not yours. And I don't want him here. Come on, Flush. <laughs> oh, don't think that by walking away that ends the matter, Charles Foster. You'd better get rid of that dog, do you hear? Glad to get out of the house, eh, old boy? Yeah, so am I. Oh, it's a beautiful evening, isn't it? Come on, boy, we're going to take a long walk. You want to turn around and go home now, Flush? <coughs> no, neither do I. Pardon me, but aren't you Charles? Julia! 
Julia Sanders. Uh, Charles, I thought it was you. Oh, let me look at you. Oh, Julia, you haven't changed a bit. You're as lovely as... How long has it been since we last saw each other? Ten years, almost eleven. Has it really been that long? Julia, have you ever forgiven me for what happened? Of course, Charles. I was so insanely in love with you, Julia, that I couldn't bear to have other men look at you. You you know that I didn't mean... I know, Charles. I've thought of that night constantly. It's been like a nightmare ever since. Please, Charles, it's all past and forgotten now. You were perfectly justified in breaking our engagement... After what I'd done, there was nothing else you could do. I understand you married Agatha Winthrop a year after I'd gone abroad. Yes, Julia. After you left for Europe, people kept telling me what a wonderful wife Agatha would make me. I allowed myself to be convinced and married her. Well, I'm sure everything turned out for the best. Oh, but it didn't, Julia. Almost from the beginning, our marriage was a failure. For these past five years, Agatha and I have merely been living together under the same roof. Well, I'm... Sorry, Charles, that it didn't turn out well. Nothing turned out well, Julia, after I lost you. I hope things have been better with you these past 11 years. Oh, I can't complain. I spent a number of years in Paris studying art and working at dress designing. Oh. I only came back a few months ago. You've uh, never married? No. I'm working now for Morgan's Department Store as their art director. Oh, Really? Well, my office is only a few blocks from there. Look, Julia, why don't we have lunch together tomorrow? There are so many things I'd like to know. Well, I'd like to, Charles, but I think it would be much better that we don't. Oh, now, surely, Julia, there's no harm in two old friends having lunch together, is there? No, I suppose not. I won't take no for an answer. Do you know where Drake's restaurant is? Yes. Will one o'clock tomorrow be all right? Yes, that's my usual lunch hour. Good, then it's a date. Strange, isn't it, Doctor? The way after 11 years, Julia and I bumped into each other. If we hadn't, what followed would never have happened. It's such small things as an accidental meeting that often change the course of one's life. Yes, I know that now, but I didn't then. I met Julia for lunch the next day, and soon we were having lunch together every day. Mm. And for the first time in years, life began to mean something. Merely seeing Julia for one hour a day made life worth living. I understand, sir. We'd have lunch together, and then we'd go for a walk in the park. I sensed at the time that Julia, too, was lonely and in the need of friendship. The summer passed swiftly and happily. I should have realized that things couldn't go on that way, but I didn't. You mean you fell in love with Julia? Fell in love with her? I don't think I'd ever really stopped loving her. I became aware of how much I really cared for her one warm autumn day as we were walking through the park together. Julia? Yes, Charles? What about going to the theater with me tonight? Oh, I wish you hadn't asked me, Charles. Why? Because it means we can't go on seeing each other anymore. But why shouldn't we go on seeing each other? Because you aren't satisfied any longer just to see me at lunch. and It isn't right for us to go out together at night. But surely there's no harm in our going to the theater together. You're married, Charles. That's reason enough. All right, Julia. Forget I ever asked you. But at least we can go on having lunch together, can't we? No, Charles. Oh, but... Can't you see? Things can never be the way they were. We've become dependent upon each other, and we have no right to be... We can't go on seeing each other any longer. It isn't fair to Agatha. But you know that Agatha and I mean nothing to each other. We haven't for years. Nevertheless, she's your wife. Julia, you, you know I love you. I've always loved you, and I can't do without you. Charles, you're just making it difficult for both of us. Julia, you do love me, don't you? Yes. But can't you see? It's no use. I remember Agatha only too well. She'd never give you a divorce. I know she won't. I've asked her a dozen times in the past five years, but she said she'll never give me one. I want to part now, Charles. Right here. Must we? Yes. Goodbye, Charles. My life seemed to end that day, Doctor. 
with our party. I went through the motions of living, but nothing seemed to matter any longer. I can well understand that. Well, months went by. Every day after work, I stayed in town, unable to face an evening at home with Agatha. When I did arrive home late at night, she'd be waiting for me. Is that you, Charles? Yes, Agatha. Sorry if I woke you. Now, lock, you care. Coming in night after night at all hours, leaving me alone in this big house. Oh, don't think I don't know what you're up to. I know your kind, Charles Foster. You better go to sleep, Agatha. A fine chance I have to sleep with you putting on the bathroom light. You know I can't sleep when that light's on. Take me a minute to brush my teeth, then I'll turn off the light. Agatha. Well, what is it now? What's this bottle of prussic acid doing in the medicine chest? That's a deadly poison. I know that. I got it from Mrs. Smedley, the druggist's wife. She used it to get rid of an old cat they had. When I told her about flush, she said it was a thing... What's that about flush? I said Mrs. Smedley gave me that bottle of prussic acid so I could get rid of flush. I'm going to put him out of his misery tomorrow. You'll do no such thing, do you hear? If you so much as lay a hand on flush, I'll kill you. I'll kill you, do you understand? Yes, yes, Charles. You get rid of that poison tomorrow. Let's have no more talk of putting flush out of his misery. I lay awake for hours, Doctor. Unable to fall asleep. Julia's breaking off with me and my wife's refusal to give me a divorce. And the prussic acid she meant to poison flush with had left me all worked up. Then Agatha began coughing. That cough she'd cultivated for years to give people the impression that she was an invalid. Well, after she'd coughed her usual five minutes or so, she got out of bed and started for the bathroom where she kept her cough medicine. Oh! Why don't you turn on the light so you can see where you're going? I can see perfectly well where I'm going. Besides, on your salary, we can't afford to waste electricity. I knew there wasn't any use in saying anything more. For years, Agatha had gotten up every night and groped her way to the medicine chest where her cough medicine was. Nothing could make her change her habits. I lay in bed listening as she opened the medicine chest and fumbled in the corner where she always kept the bottle. As I heard her groping for her medicine, I suddenly thought of the bottle that was standing next to it. The bottle of prussic acid. Without thinking, it came to mind. If only she'd take the prussic acid instead of the cough medicine. If she did, I would be free. Free of her constant nagging and whining. Free to see Julia. Then I knew it was useless to hope for such a mistake to happen. Agatha's cough medicine always stood in the same corner of the medicine chest. Even in the dark, she'd never take the bottle of prussic acid. And then... To me. What if the bottles were to be switched? What if the following night the prussic acid were placed in the customary spot of the cough medicine? Suddenly it was all very clear to me what I was going to do. Agatha? <laughs> well? Agatha, I've been thinking over what you said about flush. What? I suppose you're right. Flush should be disposed of. He certainly should. He's old and he's smelly. It'll be a blessing for him to be put out of his misery. Yes. I'm sorry I shouted at you before, Agatha, but, well, I see now that you're right. Hmm. When are you going to do it? Oh, we'll wait until Saturday. And none too soon, either. Uh, you're sure the prussic acid won't make him suffer? Nonsense. Of course it won't. Mrs. Smedley said nothing worked faster than prussic acid. Oh, you told her what it was for. Uh, that's fine. Very well, Agatha. Just leave everything to me. <laughs> Next night, Doctor, after Agatha was in bed, I quietly stole into the bathroom and opened the medicine chest. I compared the bottle of cough medicine with that of the prussic acid. They were both small bottles, almost identical in size. I removed the cough medicine from where it stood in the corner of the chest and replaced it with the poison. Then I went to bed and waited impatiently for Agatha to start coughing. <laughs> Can I get you a glass of water or something, Agatha? Oh, water won't do any good. What I need is my cough medicine. Oh, that's that chair. Why don't you turn on the light? Because I can see perfectly in the dark. Besides, someone's got to economize on the electricity in this house. I lay there in the darkness, listening to her grumble as she opened the door of the medicine chest. The blood pounded in my ears as I heard her fumbling over the bottle. Would she feel a slight difference in the bottle when she picked it up? Scarcely able to breathe, I waited. Listened. And she fell to the 
floor. I quickly got out of bed, turned on the lights, and went into the bathroom. She was lying on the floor, quite dead. There was an agonized look on her face. I returned the bottle of cough medicine to its proper place, and then I phoned the police. <laughs> Now, you say, Mr. Foster, that your wife was in the habit of going every night to the medicine chest for a few drops of her cough medicine. Yes, that's right. And she never turned on the lights when she went to the medicine chest. Oh, no, sir. Wasn't that a bit unusual? Well, I always used to tell her to turn on the lights, but she said it was a waste of electricity. I see. And you say your wife... It was her who placed the bottle of prussic acid in the medicine chest next to her cough medicine, eh? Yes, sir. I'd never touched the bottle of prussic acid. You see, it was my wife who procured it, and she... Yes, yes, Mr. Smedley, the druggist, has testified that his wife gave it to your wife. Mr. Foster, are you familiar with the contents of your wife's will dated ten years ago? Why, uh, yes, I am. Then you know, of course, that your wife left her entire estate to the home for the aged. Home for the aged? Oh, yes, yes. I fought to keep my face expressionless to prevent him from learning that I hadn't known. All the years we'd been married, Agatha had given me to understand that all her money would go to me. Now I knew that she'd been lying. Her will had been made out in favor of the home for the aged for years. I began to feel angry at the way she'd cheated me. But a moment later, I was grateful that she had. Frankly, Mr. Foster, your wife's death occurred under very suspicious circumstances, to say the least. For years, she'd gone to the medicine chest every night without mishap. And yet, on the second night that there was a bottle of prussic acid in the chest... She met her death. Were it not for the fact that your wife had left her entire estate to the home for the aged, I might be inclined to go further with this investigation. As it is, I'll instruct the coroner's jury to bring in a verdict of death through accident. That's all, Mr. Foster. I walked out of the district attorney's office a free man. A few days later, I moved out of the house which had been Agatha's and took up quarters elsewhere. Six long and uneventful months passed. I made no effort to contact Julia for fear that the police might still have their suspicions. And then I could stand it no longer. I, I called on her. Jo Charles, when I was told you were waiting to see me, I could hardly believe it. I'm so glad to see you again. Thank you, Julia. It's good to see you again, too. Charles, you don't look well at all. Well, these past few months have been something of a strain, Junior, but I'm all right now. I was tempted so many times to get in touch with you. Then I thought perhaps you didn't want to see anyone. Well, I did want to see you, Julia, but I was afraid it wouldn't look right. I understand, Charles. Now, let's not say anything more of the past. Only the present and the future. Julia, do you think we might try to pick up where we left off last autumn? We can try, Charles. Julia and I, Doctor, began to see each other night after night. Life for me became exciting and wonderful the way it had been 11 years ago before Julia and I had broken our engagement. Didn't you ever stop to think of what you'd done? You mean Agatha? Yes. No, Doctor. They say that a murderer is ever haunted by his crime. But that isn't true. Hmm. Uh, at least it wasn't in my case. To me, Agatha was part of another life in the dim past. I rarely thought of the past, only the present and the future. Now, if I had any fears at all, it was the fear that something would spoil the happiness that Julia and I had found together. But nothing did. And a few months later, we were married with you as my best man. Yes, I remember. And my second marriage was everything that my first hadn't been. The first time in my life I knew what true happiness meant. Julia and I were poor, but that didn't matter. We had each other. The months swiftly passed. And as our first anniversary approached, it was hard to believe that we'd been married almost a year. Charles, before you leave for work, will you sign a check for me? Oh, who's it for, dear? Never you mind, Mr. Foster. You just leave a signed check. I'll fill in the amount and the party it's meant for. Mrs. Foster, you're acting very mysterious. Well, wife has a right to act mysterious once a year. <laughs> Darling, I suspect you're going to use this check to buy me an anniversary present. Well, whatever you get me, please don't make it neckties. Well, I'll have you know I have very good taste in neckties. I know you do, dear, but I have to wear them. 
You are an ungrateful <laughs> wretch. Very well, I won't get you time. Good, then I'll sign the check for you. And please bear in mind that you can't make this check out for more than $312.50. That's all we have in the bank. Oh, I'll leave you at least the 50 cents. You'd better leave a good deal more. Oh, we won't be going up to Lake Ellis. Charles, are we going up to Lake Ellis? Oh, see, it slipped out. And I meant it as an anniversary surprise. Oh, Charles, that's wonderful. When are we going? This Friday afternoon. I've rented a cabin and a small motorboat on Lake Ellis for the weekend. Oh, darling, what an exciting surprise. Charles, you're sure it won't be too expensive? Why, nothing can be too expensive for our first anniversary. <laughs> oh, darling, I've never been so happy. <laughs> This looks like a nice place to fish. Oh, let's see, where'd I put that bait? Here it is, dear. Thanks, darling. Uh-huh. Ah, here's a nice, fat, dimpled worm. <laughs> well, if you can't stand to see me bait, I'm just turn the other way. That's it. It'll only take me a minute. Charles, look. Yes, we'd like to get this. There's smoke coming out of the engine hatch. What's that? Yes, you're right. It's on fire. There are flames shooting out. Fire extinguishers at the other end of the boat. Charles, you'd never make it. You'd be burned. Yes, you're right. Besides, even the extinguisher wouldn't do much good now. The fire's too big. What are we going to do? Oh, the heat, it's becoming unbearable. There's only one thing we can do, Julia. Let's go over the side. We're almost in the center of the lake. I can't swim. But I can't, dear. I'll manage to keep us above water somehow. Well, all right, darling. I'll do whatever you say. We'll come through this, Julia. Now, don't be afraid. Now, I'll slip over the side of the boat first, and you follow. All right. Now, hurry, Julia. Let yourself down into the water. I'll keep you afloat. Yes, Charles. Ah, that's it. <coughs> now, now, let go of the side of the boat. I have you. Yes, Charles. Now, don't be afraid, darling. You see? It's no trouble keeping you above water. Now, now just relax, dear, while I swim with you a bit. We've got to get a good distance from the boat. It may explode. Yes, Charles. Do you see any boats wrong? No, but someone's bound to see the fire and come to our rescue. Until they do, we must have courage. Aren't you, Charles? No. Now, don't worry, dear. I can keep us afloat for a long time yet. Oh, why doesn't someone come to our rescue? They will. Someone must surely have seen that boat burning. But Charles, we've been in the water so long. Oh, it just seems long, darling. It can't be more than ten minutes. Ten minutes? It feels more like... Charles! Yeah, I've got you, Jimmy. <laughs> Just for a moment, you, you slipped away from me. Oh, yes. Charlie, it's no use. I'm just a millstone around your neck. What, what are you saying? Why should we both drown? Charles, save yourself. Save myself? Yes. I want you to let go of me. Let go of you? No. No, never. Yes, you must. You're too tired to keep me. No. no, darling. Either we're both saved... Oh, we're both drowned. Oh, I won't have you throw your life away. Let go of me. Julia, Julia, stop trying to break loose. Julia, darling, don't. I can't live without you. Julia, stop struggling. Save Julia! Help! Help, my wife! My wife! My wife! She... Yeah, yeah, we saw it all. Hey, Mike, he's passed out. Get him before he goes under. Yeah. Uh, I got him. Hey, yeah, help me get him aboard, Skipper. All right, all right. Any sign of his wife? Uh, she's gone, Skipper. Yeah, too bad. Well, if it's the last thing I do, I aim to see justice done to this fella. She never had a chance. Did you see him shove her under? It was murder, that's what it was. Mr. Foster, both of the men who rescued you claim that as they approached you and your late wife in their boat, they saw you struggling with her. You admit this? Yes. Yes, but I tell you, I was trying to save her, not drown her. No, you were trying to save her. 
But both the witnesses testify they saw you push her head under. Oh, they're wrong. I wasn't pushing her under. I was trying to bring her to the surface. You must believe me. Oh, Mr. Foster. You maintain that you were rescuing your wife, not drowning her. Yes. Is it true, Mr. Foster, that you were engaged to your wife 11 years ago and that she broke the engagement? Yes, that's true. Would you mind telling the jury why she broke the engagement? We... We had a misunderstanding. A misunderstanding. Do you call shooting the woman you're engaged to just a misunderstanding? No, no. You must let me explain. It's true that 11 years ago I did shoot Julia, but I've been drinking. I didn't know what Mr. I was doing. Mr. Foster, you do admit shooting and wounding her. Yes, yes. Have you ever seen this before? Why, yes. That's the insurance policy I took out for Julia and myself. Exactly. And when was this policy taken out? Well... About a month ago. June 15th, to be exact. And what's the value of this policy, Mr. Forster? Well, if either my wife or myself died, it provided $10,000 for the survivor. Yes, Mr. Forster. If either you or your wife died a natural death, it provided $10,000 to the survivor. But there's also a double indemnity clause in this policy, isn't there? Yes, but I... One that provides you with $20,000 if your wife died an accidental death. Such as drowning. Yes, that's true, but I swear I didn't drown my wife. I tell you, I was trying to save her. Save her, not drown her. You must believe me. You must... And that, Doctor, is exactly the way everything happened. Strange, isn't it? The way justice works itself out. I committed murder and escaped punishment. Now I'm paying with my life for the death of the one person I really loved. It's time to go, Foster. All right, Warden. Goodbye, Doctor. And take good care of Flush, will you? Of course, Charles. Goodbye. All right, Warden. I'm ready. Let's go. Traveler again. Did you enjoy our little trip? Too bad about Charles Foster, wasn't it? As he was strapped into the electric chair, there was an ironic smile on his lips, for he was being executed for something he had not done. But as Charles himself said, justice has a strange way of working itself out. I knew another man once who thought it would be a simple thing to dispose of his wife. Uh, unfortunately, he... Uh... Oh, you're getting off here? I'm sorry. But perhaps we'll meet again soon. I take this same train every week at this time. You have just heard Chapter 64 of The Mysterious Traveler a series of dramas of the strange and the terrifying. In tonight's story, the case of Charles Foster, Humphrey Davis played Charles Foster, Nancy Sheridan played Julia, and Joan Shea played Agatha. The Mysterious Traveler is written by Bob Arthur and David Cogan, and original music is played by Henry Silburn. The entire production is under the direction of Jock McGregor. <laughs> Listen next week to a tale titled Blood Money. Another tale of the mysterious traveler. The Mysterious Traveler is presented by WOR Mutual from the WOR Studios in New York. This is Mutual. <laughs>
Mutual presents The Mysterious Traveler. This is The Mysterious Traveler, inviting you to join me on another journey into the realm of the strange and the terrifying. I hope you will enjoy the trip, that it will thrill you a little and chill you a little. So settle back, get a good grip on your nerves, and be comfortable, if you can, as you hear the story I call, (coughs) They Struck It Rich. Our story tonight begins behind the high gray walls of a state penitentiary. It is early Monday morning, and Dr. Richard Worth has just taken up his duties as a newly appointed staff psychiatrist at the prison. As he sits in his office studying the medical records that have been turned over to him, there's a knock on his door. Come in. Sorry to bother you, doctor, but they uh, just brought a prisoner from the warden's office for you to examine. Case of hysteria. Hysteria? That's what they said. Very well, Cook. Show him in. Okay, in here, fellow. <laughs> That's a hot one, really a hot one. <laughs> Me, Frankie Williams, on top at last. I'm a big shot. <laughs> Here's his medical record, Doc. Well, thanks, Cook. That'll be all. Yes, sir. <laughs> all right, sit down, Williams. <laughs> Williams, sit down. <laughs> That's better. Here, drink this. Drink this. Uh, now, let me see. Frank Williams, <laughs> age 34. Uh huh. How do you feel now, Williams? Uh, I'm okay now, Doc. I guess the news was too much for me. But everything's going to be all right now. You know what I mean. You take care of me, Doc, and I'll take care of you. I see. Williams, uh, tell me about yourself. What do you want to know? Well, anything you feel like talking about. Tell me about uh, your childhood, uh, how you happened to be in prison. Well, when I was 14, I was sent to reform school for knifing a guy. When I was 18, I got a four to six year stretch for a stick up. Mm hmm. Well, why are you in prison now? You mean you don't know? I'm afraid not. The dark. Six years ago, my picture was in every paper in the country. I was famous. Well, six years ago, I was in a Japanese prison of war camp. So I'm not familiar with your exploits. Well, why don't you tell me about it? Sure, Doc. It all began back in 41, about a month before Pearl Harbor. i just gotten out of the big house on parole, and I managed to land a job as a sand hog on a tunnel that was building under the East River between Brooklyn and Manhattan. Well, one day I'm knocking off for work when I hear my name being called by... Hey, Frank. Frank Williams. What's the matter? Don't you recognize an old pal? Marty! Marty Davis, how are you, pal? Swell. Hey. <laughs> When'd you get out, kid? Two weeks ago. Parole, huh? Yeah. You working on this tunnel, too? Yeah, six months now. Huh? Frank, you're just the boy I'm looking for. Uh, what's up? Ever since I got out, I've been working on a little idea of mine. It'll take two guys, and the haul will be at least a hundred grand. Oh, nothing doing, Marty. What do you think I took this job for? I'm a three-time loser. One more rap, and they'll send me up for life. Look, kid, ain't I in the same boat? I'm a three-time loser, too. And you ought to have more sense. From now on, I'm going straight. I'm not going to risk getting a life sentence. But, Frank, this idea of mine, it ain't any cheap stick-up. It's something big. And there's enough dough in it so that we can retire for the rest of our lives. Nothing doing. Ain't you even interested? No. They sure got you scared of that life sentence, ain't they? Yeah. So long, Marty. See you around. I left Marty standing there, Doc, and walked away. There's one thing you got to say for Marty. He don't discourage easy. Day after day, he'd be waiting for me when I knocked off work. We'd have a few drinks together, and then Marty would go to work on me, trying to suck me into this big job he kept hinting about. Got so I took to avoiding him. And one night while I was in a bar on the east side, Marty comes in and sees me sitting alone at a table. He pulls up a chair and sits down. Hello, kid. Did you hear the news? What news? Now that this country's in the war, they're going to stop working on the tunnel. You and me are going to be out of work in a couple of days. It's okay with me. I was getting sick of that job anyway. What are you going to do now? I don't know. Why don't you play it smart? Throw in with me. 
I tell you, kid, this job I got lined up can't miss. That's what you keep saying. Frank, I feel so sure that if you knew what the job was, you'd go in with me. So I'm going to tell you about it. I ain't asking you to. I'll take a chance. While we was in stir, you remember me telling you about where I grew up? Yeah, on the East River up around 163th. Yeah, and Hellgate. I also told you about the way I was a sewerage pipe inspector for the city when I was a kid. Yeah, I remember. Frank, not many people know what the island of Manhattan is like underground. It's more than just a couple of subways. Why, underneath the streets are big gas mains, water pipes, electric lines, phone cables and tunnels, and sewerage pipes big enough to drive a car through. What are you getting at? Kid, there's hardly a square foot underground this island that ain't honeycombed with pipes and sewers. And when it comes to sewerage systems up in my old neighborhood, I'm what you might call an expert. Okay, so what? Come on over to my room. I want to show you something. Yeah, what? You'll see. Come on. Let's go. Give me a hand unrolling this map, will you? It's pretty big. Okay. Yeah. You recognize it? Well, this is the East River, ain't it? And this is a section of Manhattan from 86th Street up to 125th Street. That's right. What are all these red, yellow, green, and blue lines on it? The red lines are electric cables. Yellow lines are gas mains. Uh The green are water pipes, and the blue are phone cables. And the black lines are sewerage pipes. This is an official city map that I lifted. Uh, You were sure right when you said this island is honeycomb. Yeah. You see this place I got my finger on? Yeah. 106th Street and East River. That's right. But what this map doesn't show is that this is where the Hellgate Bank and Trust Company is. Hellgate Bank? Yeah. Oh. Now I'm beginning to get your idea. Look at this black line that runs into the East River. That's a big 10-foot sewerage pipe. And it runs past the bank, only 60 feet away. Uh Uh-huh. You and me, we ought to be able to dig a tunnel from the sewer to under the vault of the bank in ten nights. Oh, there's one thing you're forgetting. What's that? This island is all sandstone. How are we going to tunnel through stone? That calls for drills. Kid, the island of Manhattan may be all sandstone, but at this point, where the bank is, it's all dirt. Dirt? Yeah. You see, the riverbed has been shifting these past hundreds of years. And during all that time, mud's been accumulating along this stretch at 106th Street. Today, all that mud is part of the island. With buildings on it. And one of the buildings on it is the Hellgate Bank. Yeah, I sure got to hand it to you, Marty. You got all the answers. I spent enough time casing this job to make me an expert. Wouldn't be too tough to tunnel through 60 foot of dirt? Of course it wouldn't. And think of what the jackpot would be, kid. I'll guarantee you there'll be at least 100 grand in the vault. What do you say? 100 G's. And a two-way split. Okay, Marty. You can count me in. A few days later, Marty and me moved into a basement cold water flat a block away from the bank. Every night for a week, we kept bringing to the flat things we would need for the job. A two-man rubber raft, shovels, big axes, flashlights, tape measures, small boards for shoring up the tunnel. No college engineer ever cased the job better. A couple of weeks later, Marty and me figured we was ready. We waited until a dark night, then we took the rubber raft, a shovel and a pickaxe, and left the flat. We went to the rear of the old tenement house where there was a manhole that led down into the sewerage pipe. We eased the manhole cover off, and Marty started down the ladder. I handed him the stuff, and then I followed, after pulling the cover back on the manhole. Fifteen foot down, Marty was standing on a small ledge. The water swirled past a little below the ledge. Frank, hold the raft while I fill it with air. Okay, Marty. Now, where'd I put that tube? Ah, here it is. It shouldn't take more than a minute to fill it up. Hey, is there any danger of gas down here, Marty? Not in winter. Boy, that water's sure running fast. Yeah. We'll have to be careful or we're liable to be swept out to the river. Okay, Frank, she's all filled up. Now drop the raft into the water and hold on to it. Right. Ah, just wait until I tie the end of this rope to the ladder. Now, get in, kid. Yep. That's it. Now, hold the raft steady while I get in. Easy does it, buddy. Now, I'll play this rope out nice and slow, 
and we'll float down to the right spot. Here's the first knot on the rope, and that's 50 feet. A hundred. A hundred and fifty. Two hundred. This is it, kid. Right here. Okay, Marty. Now try to hold the raft as steady as you can while I break into the wall with this big axe. <coughs> this is going to be a tough job. Yeah. I feel as though my arms are being pulled off trying to hold this raft steady in this current. I only hope that this rope I'm hanging on to don't give. We shoot out to the river. If it did. Now you coming. Again there. <clears throat> that night we broke through the concrete wall and reached dirt. The second night we tunneled through five feet, slanting it upwards so that if the water in the sewer rose, our tunnel wouldn't be flooded. The third night, we dug another six feet, shoring up every other foot so there wouldn't be any cave-in. Night after night, we worked. And soon the tunnel was slanting down sharply so as to end up under the floor of the vault. While one of us dug, the other would get rid of the dirt. On a Wednesday night, exactly two weeks from the time we'd started, we figured we were under the vault of the bank. Marty and me rested up a couple of days. Then on Saturday afternoon, we went over our plans for the last time. Well, this is it, Frank. Tonight's the payoff. At about 9 o'clock, we'll leave. Yeah, it shouldn't take us more than an hour to burn through the floor of the vault. You know what those old bank vaults are like. The sides and top are a couple of feet thick, but the floors are always thin. Sure. We won't have much trouble. We should have the vault cleaned out by midnight. We'll spend the rest of the night getting rid of the equipment. The river, huh? Yeah. Then we'll go over this flat with a fine-tooth comb. Make sure we ain't leaving anything behind. And we'll wipe down the whole place so the cops won't find any prints. By tomorrow morning, we should be ready to travel. That's right. When the bank opens Monday morning, we'll be in the hideout upstate. Hmm. A few months there, the heat will be off. And then you and me, kid, are gonna have ourselves a time. <laughs> <laughs> we sure are, buddy. Okay. We'd better try to grab a couple of hours shut-eye. We got a tough night ahead of us. I hit the sack and tried to get some shut eye, but I was too keyed up to fall asleep. The hours dragged by, and soon it got dark. At nine o'clock, we left the flat. A few minutes later, we were going down the ladder into the sewer. We filled the raft with air, loaded our equipment on it, then floated down the sewer to the tunnel we built. Each of us grabbed a suitcase and started snaking our way through the tunnel. First, there was a gradual climb of 15 feet. Then the tunnel sloped sharply for 50 feet, with us ending up under the vault. Marty got out the tools and scraped away the last foot of dirt, exposing the floor of the vault. Then I got to work with the acetylene torch. It was tough working in a three-by-four hole. A half hour passed, and I was still burning my way through. How's it coming, Frank? Won't be long now, Marty. The air is sure foul in here. Yeah, it's hard to breathe. I think that does it. Hand me the pickaxe, Marty. Here you are, kid. Just a couple of taps and this piece of floor should give. Here it comes. Help me ease it down. It's a pleasure. Come here. Okay, kid. Up you go. You got your flash? Yeah, I got it. Hey, Marty. I'm in the vault. Pick him up dead center. You sure had it figured out to the end. Yeah. <laughs> Not bad for a guy who never finished the fifth grade. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, <Yeah>. kid. <laughs> Let's take a look at the cash drawers. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Marty. Look at it. The whole drawer is full of bundles of bills. There must be a hundred G's here. That's only part of it. Now remember, no new bills... And nothing smaller than 20. Okay, Marty. I'll get the suitcases. Well, kid, that does it. 120 G's. We couldn't cram another bill into these suitcases if we tried. Gee, Marty. Look at all this stuff we're leaving behind. Yeah, I know how you feel. 
But this is as much as we can carry. Come on, Frank. Grab one of the suitcases and half the equipment. Okay, Marty. We're going to have a tough time hauling all this stuff back through the tunnel. You all set? Yeah. I lead the way. Make sure nothing's left behind. Don't worry. I've double-checked. Okay, Frank. Come on. I'm coming. The best way is to push the suitcase ahead of you. Yeah. With the equipment piled on top of it. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. You okay, Frank? Yeah, I'm right behind you. That's funny. I feel as though I'm slowly sinking. Yeah. Marty, the floor's caving in. We're falling. We're falling! Uh, Marty. Marty, where are you? I'm over here. You okay? Yeah, I think so. What about you? I just had the wind knocked out of me. Sure is dark. What happened? The floor of our tunnel caved in. Yeah. I wonder where we are. You got your flashlight? Uh, no, I, I dropped it when I fell. Yeah, so did I. Feel around, Frank. Should be near you. Okay, Marty. This would happen to us just when we hit the jackpot. Yeah, what lousy luck. You find it yet? No, the ground here is just mud, soft mud and puddles of water. Frank, I found my flesh. Is it awake? Wait a minute. Yeah. Now let's have a look at this place. Uh, it's a small cave. Yeah, you're right. Wait till I shine the beam on the ceiling. Buddy, look. There's the hole in the ceiling where we fell through. Yeah, that was a 30-foot fall. If we hadn't landed on mud, we'd really been banged up. Without a ladder, we'll never be able to reach that opening in the ceiling. Yeah, I know. Now, let's see what the rest of this place looks like. Hmm. Ain't very big, is it? There's nothing but mud walls. Marty, we're trapped. Take it easy, kid. It ain't that bad. We still got our tools, the torch, and most important of all, the dough. Not a good that'll do us if we don't get out of here. We'll get out. Give me that pickaxe. What are you going to do? I want to see what this wall is like. This is the river end, all right. Nothing but mud. Now, this is what we're going to do, Frank. We'll dig in about five feet or so, and then we'll start tunneling our way up. Sixty feet? That'll take us a week. Well, I'm hoping we'll run into a shaft or something. It's our only chance, kid. Yeah, I guess you're right. Now, hold the flash for me. That's it. Now, shine it against the wall while I start digging. I guess you dug about three feet, Marty. Yeah, just about. You want me to take over? No, I ain't tired yet. Frank, I struck wood. Heavy wood. What do you think it is? I don't know. Maybe it's a wall of an old cellar. A cellar? This deep? Could be. Hold the flash closer while I scrape away the mud from the wood. Look, it's a solid wall of heavy timber. It must be at least 100 years old. See how rotten that wood is? It sounds hollow. I'll bet it's a cellar. You think it might lead up to some old building? Could be. Get the torch, Frank. Let's burn our way through. Okay, Marty. Feels about eight or nine inches thick. Well, here's the torch, but it ain't gonna last long, Marty. It's almost all used up. Yeah, I figured as much. Well, go ahead, kid. See what you can do. Yeah, just about got it, Marty. Good. Oh, there goes the torch. Uh, stop. Now we'll have to break in the rest of the way. Yeah, hold the flash, kid, while I use the pickaxe. That's it. Couple more and it should give. Uh, uh, we got an opening. Give me the flash, Frank. Here you are. What do you see, Marty? Looks like a room of some sort. The floor is about three feet down, covered with mud. I'm going to climb in. Come on in, Frank. I'm coming. I'll hold the flash this way. The air in here is sure musty. I'll shoot the beam around so we can see what this place looks like. <sighs> What's the matter with you? Marty, didn't you see it? Over there in the corner. 
something white. It looked like a skeleton. A skeleton? Yeah, you're right. Let's take a look at it. Marty, I want to get out of here. I don't like this. Get hold of yourself, will you? Uh, well, look at this. A sword. A sword? Yeah, and an old one, too. And the skeleton, it has the remains of a uniform on it. Frank, this ain't no cellar. We're on a ship. A ship? Yeah. This is a cabin we're in. But what would a ship be doing here? Back in the old times, the East River at this point was dangerous to sailing ships. That's how it became known as Hellgate. So many ships used to sink at this part of the river. And this is one of the ships that sank in Hellgate? Yeah. It probably sank over 100 years ago. And the tide swept it along the bottom of the river to this bank. As the years passed, the wreck became covered with mud. The riverbed changed, leaving it behind. You mean this wreck is buried under the East River shore? Yeah, that's what I figure. There ought to be a door somewhere in this cabin leading to a passageway. You see it? No. But then the walls are so covered with mud, it's hard to tell. Yeah. Wait a minute. There may be a door here. Hand me the pickaxe. Here you are. It's a door, all right. And here's the handle. Is it a passageway, Marty? No. No, it's a small room. Look, there's a half a dozen chests in here. Chests? Yeah. They have locks on them, too. Wait till I break the lock on this one. <clears throat> that does it. The lid seems stuck. Help me lift it. Okay. Now lift. Hey, look. It's full of copper coins. Frank, these ain't copper coins. Huh? Look, scratch one. These coins are gold. Gold? Frank, this is a treasure ship. A treasure ship, do you hear? Well, there's ten times as much dough here as there was in the bank. Oh. We're rich, kid. We're rich. How much? How much do you think there is in here? I don't know. There must be millions. Think of it. And it's all ours. How are we going to get it out of here? How are we going to get out of here, Marty? Yeah, that's right. This wreck is probably buried 60 feet under the East River Bank. Yeah. We'll have to go back to the cave and find another spot where we can start digging our way out. But, but what about all this gold? Don't worry, kid. We'll be back for it. But first we've got to get out ourselves. Come on. Let's go back to the cave. Yeah. The air is sure better in the cave. Yeah. Now, let's try one of these other walls. You start digging, Frank. Okay, Marty, you just... The beam is flickering. Yeah, the batteries are shot. There it goes. Marty, we can't dig our way out in the dark. Well, don't you think I know it? It looks like the game is over, kid. Well, you may as well sit down and take it easy. But... We just can't stay here in the dark. You got any better ideas? No. Guess not. What's going to happen to us, Marty? Come Monday morning, the cops will be swarming all over the bank. They'll find the tunnel we dug under the vault. Then they'll find us. Probably some fat sergeant will fall through the tunnel and land in our laps. And the 120 G's and, and all the gold we found... Well, the bank will get back to 120 G's, and as for the gold we found, your guess is as good as mine. <laughs> That's a hot one. We hit the jackpot twice in one night to the tune of millions, and we end up behind the eight ball. <laughs> this is really a hot one. All that has to happen now is for that fat sergeant to fall through the tunnel and land in our lap. <laughs> <laughs> That's just what happened. The fat cop fell through the floor of the tunnel and landed right on our laps. <laughs> Ain't that a hard uh, one? Williams, Williams, get hold of yourself. Uh, get hold of yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm okay, Doc. I'm All okay. Right. <laughs> what happened after the police found you in the cave? Well, uh, Marty and me led the cops to the wreck. 
You, you should have seen their faces, Doc, when they saw the gold. Mm. Uh, and the, the wreck you discovered, uh, what ship was it? You, you mean you didn't read about it in the papers, Doc? Back in January of 42? Oh, it was in all the headlines. Well, I told you that at the time I was in a Japanese prisoner of war camp. Oh. Well, Doc, that wreck that Marty and me found buried in the mud was the British treasure ship Hussar, which sank in the East River at Hellgate on September 13, 1780. British treasure ship, huh? How much gold was it carrying? A million pounds in gold, Doc. That's over four million bucks. Four million? Yeah. The gold was sent over here to pay off the British soldiers who was fighting the Americans during the Revolution. I see. Marty and me heard all about it while we was waiting to go on trial for robbing the Hellgate Bank. Ah. I see by your record here you were found guilty and received a life sentence. Yeah, me and Marty both. The Hellgate Bank robbery made us four-time losers. Uh... It's been six years, Doc, since we found the wreck. Six years. Tell me, uh, who got the four million dollars in gold that you found? Ain't you heard, Doc? Heard what? Well, I just come from the warden's office. The warden, he tells me that after five years of legal scrapping by my mouthpiece, Marty and me are going to get two million bucks of that gold. Think of it, Doc. A million bucks apiece. A million dollars? Yeah. Ain't that a hot one, Doc? The court gives me a million bucks. You know what that means? I'm a millionaire. The richest guy in this prison. Only, Doc, how am I going to spend it? This is the mysterious traveler again. Did you enjoy our little trip? What happened to Frank Williams? Oh, the rich fellow is still serving his life sentence. All of his fellow prisoners have nicknamed him the millionaire. But the problem of spending the money is driving Frank crazy. However, he hasn't given up yet. Right now, he's figuring out how he can uh, take it with him. Now, I recall another young man once who decided that money was the root of all evil, so he... Oh, you have to get off here. I'm sorry. I'm sure we'll meet again. I take this same train every week at this same time. You've just heard The Mysterious Traveler, a series of dramas of the strange and terrifying... All characters in tonight's story were fictitious, and any resemblance to the names of actual persons was purely coincidental. In tonight's cast were Maurice Toplin, Joe DeSantis, and Frank Thomas. Original music by Paul Taubman. The Mysterious Traveler is written, produced, and directed by Bob Arthur and David Cogan. Listen next week to a tale titled... Seven Years to Wait. Another strange and suspenseful tale of the Mysterious Traveler. This program has come to you from our New York studios. Another program of tense and dramatic action will follow in just a minute. Stay tuned to the station for Official Detective. Carl Caruso speaking. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Broadcasting System presents The Mysterious Traveler, written, produced, and directed by Robert A. Arthur and David Cogan, and starring tonight two of radio's foremost personalities, Santos Ortega and Ann Shepard, in Out of the Past. This is The Mysterious Traveler, inviting you to join me on another journey into the realm of the strange and the terrifying. I hope you will enjoy the trip, that it will thrill you a little and chill you a little. So settle back, get a good grip on your nerves, and be comfortable, if you can, as you hear Out of the Past. <laughs> Good 
Your name is Joan Morgan. And as you stand looking over Central Park from your penthouse terrace on this beautiful spring day, you can't help but feel you're the luckiest woman living. You're young, attractive, fairly wealthy, and happily married to a Broadway actor. Yes, Joan, there's little more you could ask for. The doorbell rings. You run to the door to greet your husband, Keith, who's home from his matinee performance. Hello, beautiful. How's my one and only? Hello, darling. <laughs> oh, Keith, no wonder every actress wants to have you for her leading man. Nonsense. I'll have you know the only person I kiss like that is my wife. Mm. <laughs> you better say that. How is the matinee today? Fine. I got seven curtain calls. Oh, here's the afternoon mail. I picked it up at the desk. Oh, anything for me? I haven't looked it over there. Oh, yes, here's one for me. Three others for you, dear. Let's see. Hmm. This one's a bill from the hotel management. Darling, we're living beyond our means. Oh, Keith, you're not going to start that again, are you? Well, we have over half a million dollars. I've told you a dozen times I won't touch that money. It's yours, not but mine. Darling, it isn't a question of it being yours or mine. It's jo ours. Joan, I made it clear to you when we got married that we'd have to live on the money I earn. Then what'll I do with my money if you won't allow me to spend it? Well, someday we'll have six children. You can save it for them. <laughs> <laughs> All right, darling. I wonder who my letter can be from. You rip open the envelope, Joan, as Keith looks at the rest of his mail. For a moment you feel as if your heart has stopped, and it begins to beat wildly. Over and over you read the two sentences. A friend from Europe expects you tomorrow afternoon at 2 o'clock at the Hotel Edgewood. Please bring $25,000 in cash, or else I shall be forced to take action. John Benedict. Joan, what is it? What's wrong, darling? Uh, what did you say? You look so upset. Is it that letter you're reading? Letter? No. No. Well, then, if it isn't the letter, what is it? It's nothing, darling, nothing at all. It's just that uh, I have a headache. Oh, I'm sorry. Can I get you something? No, Keith, no, no, I'll be all right. All I need is a little rest. Come in, won't you, Joan? Sorry to have kept you waiting. Martin, you must help me. Why, of course, Joan. You know I'd do anything for you. Sit down and tell me about it. Martin, I'm in trouble. I'm in great trouble. Well, Joan, what is it? What's wrong? I'm being blackmailed. Blackmailed? Yes. By whom? A man named John Benedict. I don't know who he is. But I received a letter from him yesterday afternoon. There's only one thing to do, and that's to go to the police. I'll call the district no, attorney. No, 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 no. I, I, I can't go to the police. Why not? This... This man, Benedict, knows something I can't afford to have exposed. What does he know, Joan? Please, don't, don't ask me. I, I know that... You were my father's best friend, but I can't tell you. Believe me, if it... If it ever gets out, it would ruin my marriage. My life. I, I couldn't stand to lose Keith. I couldn't. I'd rather die. All right, Joan. I think you're making a mistake, but I'll help you. How much money does this man Benedict want? A half hour later, you enter a dingy hotel and go to room 14. As Martin opens the door, he reveals a squalid, dimly lit room. For the first time, Joan, you see John Benedict. He's a tall, heavy man with coarse features and a thick black beard. In the half-light, he appears to be about 50. His clothes are of fine English cut, but time and wear have taken their toll. He stares at you for a moment, Joan... Then speaks. How do you do, Mrs. Morgan? Won't you please come in? Thank you. This is Mr. Walker, friend. Yes, yes, of course. 
I trust you will forgive me these dismal surroundings, but alas, I am quite penniless. So you thought it would be an excellent idea to blackmail this lady for funds? I am afraid you misunderstand me, Mr. Walker. I am not forcing this beautiful lady to give me 5,000 pounds. Rather, I am, shall we say, requesting a loan. Yes, but if she doesn't give you this loan, you'll ruin her marriage or her life. It would distress me to ruin anyone's life. But then it also distresses me to live in a pigsty like this. A much more suitable place would be the state penitentiary. Martin, please don't talk like that. Evidently, Mrs. Morgan, your friend is more interested in having me just in prison than in saving you from disaster. I'm afraid you have not revealed our little secret to Mr. Walker. No. No, I haven't. Well, then... Perhaps if we were to tell him, he would not be quite so eager to imprison me. Perhaps if he knew that at one time you had... No, no, no. Don't say any more. I'll, I'll pay you. Allow me to commend you on your good judgment. Martin, give him the money. Give it to him. Very well. Here's your filthy blood money. Thank you. I think you have been very wise, Mrs. Morgan. Very wise indeed. Good day. In the weeks that follow, Joan, you try to forget Mr. Benedict and the terrifying secret he shares with you. But you aren't successful, are you? Everywhere you go, you unconsciously find yourself fearfully looking for him. Life has become tense, frightening. Then one afternoon, while Keith is at rehearsal of a new play, you receive a phone call. A call that sends you in a panic to Martin Walker's office. Martin, I've heard from him again. Benedict? Yes, he phoned an hour ago. He wants $50,000. 50000 Maybe now you'll have sense enough to let me turn this over to the police. No, I can't do that. You mean you're going to buy him off a second time? Yes, I must. But, but you can't. What's to prevent his extorting money from you a third or a fourth time? He'll squeeze you dry. The money doesn't matter, do you hear? Nothing matters but keeping what Benedict knows from Keith. If Keith finds out, it'll mean the end of everything for me. Everything. Ah, good afternoon, Mrs. Morgan. Oh, I see you brought Mr. Walker. And I was counting on a pleasant afternoon. May I take your call? No. Thank Benedict, you. what do you mean by asking for $50,000? We paid you 25000 That was supposed to keep your mouth shut. Well, it has, up to now. But as you can see by this suite of rooms, Mr. Walker, it takes money to live lavishly. Therefore, I shall need more. Well, you shan't have it. We paid you off once. We're not paying you off again. There's a limit to what anyone will pay. Yes, quite true, Mr. Walker. But the limit has not been reached. As yet. You swine. If I had my way, I'd call the police and put you where you belong. Mrs. Morgan, I am afraid you are allowing your friend to go too far. I have but to pick up this telephone, and your world will come crashing down about. No, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't, don't. D Martin, give him the money. But you give know. it to him. I can't stand this. Oh, Very well. Here it is, Benedict. But I warn you, you'd better not try anything further. There is such a thing as pushing a person too far. I shall try to remember that, Mr. Walker. Thank you for your advice and the money. You're trembling with fear as you leave Benedict's luxurious suite, aren't you, Joan? And even when you reach your own apartment, the fear hasn't left you. Weeks pass. Life is a nightmare. Every time someone knocks at the door or the phone rings, your heart begins to beat wildly. And worst of all, Keith senses something is wrong. I'll answer it, But I'm much closer to it there. Hello? Is this Mr. Morgan's apartment? Yes. This is the stage manager of the theater. Will you please remind Mr. Morgan of the special matinee we're giving today? Oh, Yes. Yes, I'll tell him. It w was a theater calling, Keith, to remind you of today's special performance. I haven't forgotten. It's only five of two. 
I still have a few minutes before I have to leave. Joan. Yes? What is it, darling? What's come over you? Come over me? Yes. These past weeks, you've been just a bundle of nerves. Every time the phone rings or the mail arrives, you begin to tremble. What's wrong? Darling, you're just imagining all that. Joan, stop acting as though I were a child. I can see something's wrong, and I want to know what it is. Keith, please. There's nothing... Who could that be? Never mind, I'll get it. No, you just Keith, I would rather... Rest. Look, darling, you have to get to the... Yes. To the... What's taking him so long? Why, why doesn't he come back? Keith? Who is it? Keith! Joan, what is it? Why did you scream like that? I, I didn't scream. Who was that at the door? Well, it was just a special delivery boy. He brought this special delivery for you. Special delivery? Yes, here. Thank you. Aren't you going to open it? After all, it is a special delivery. Yes. Of course. I never saw anyone so afraid of a letter. Who's it from? Joan, what's wrong? Nothing. No, nothing, nothing. Don't tell me that. You look as though you were going to collapse. Now, give me that letter. No, 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 I said, please, Keith. Give it to me. No, please. Yeah, that's better. Perhaps this letter will tell me what's wrong. Why, well, it's only one sentence. I will phone you at two. There isn't even a signature. Look, no, Joan. I... I don't know. You must know, else why would you have grown so pale? I will phone you at two. It's almost two now. I'll wait for that call. Keith, please. You must have faith in me. All these weeks I've had faith, said nothing, hoping you'd tell me what was wrong. Now I must find out for myself. Well, right on time. Keith, Just two o'clock. Please, don't answer. Take your phone. Take your hand off the phone, please, Joan. Please, Keith, no. I said I won't take let your you hand off the it. phone. No. Hello? 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 No answer. Another call hung up when they heard my voice. <laughs> I suppose you won't tell me who it is? <laughs> All right, then. I have to leave for the matinee now. I won't be home for dinner, but when I return after tonight's performance, we'll have this out once and for all. Please. Please. I just can't tell you. If you'd only... Goodbye, wait, Joan. Keith. Keith. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> oh, darling. If only I could tell you. But I know you wouldn't want me then. How could you? How could you if you knew? Must be he. Must be he again. Hello? Good afternoon, Mrs. Morgan. You... I promised you'd leave me alone, that I'd never hear from you again. That was only a month ago. Yes, I know. Ah, but then, I am always making promises I must keep. You've ruined everything, everything. My husband read the special delivery letter you sent. He answered the phone when you called a few minutes ago. How can I explain? Oh, that should not be too difficult for a clever woman like yourself. And you are a clever woman. Are you not? What do you want? I'm tired of your playing cat and mouse with me. I intend to call on you at 5.30 this afternoon. I won't pay you another cent, do you hear? There's no end to your demands. You may expect me at 5.30. No. And do not have Walker there. No, I won't see you. I won't... Hello? 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 I won't see you! <laughs> Good afternoon, Mrs. Morgan. As you can see, I am right on time. It is exactly 5.30. This is a lovely penthouse you have. It's 
good to see you without walking around. How can you do this to me? I've never harmed you. Why do you insist on ruining my life? Why? My dear lady, the last thing I desire to do is to ruin your life. Unfortunately, the world you and I live in being what it is, I am forced by circumstances to live by my wits. If I give you the money now, how do I know you won't be back in another month? Oh, that is very simple. Because after you pay me off this time, there would not be any point in my bothering you again. What do you mean? I mean, Mrs. Morgan, that this time I want a half million dollars. A half million dollars? Yes. If I am not mistaken, that is what the balance of your fortune amounts to. Do you not see? Once you have paid it over to me, there would be no point in my bothering you anymore. Simple, is it not? You must be mad. I? Oh, no, Mrs. Morgan, not I. Come now, you love your husband and he loves you. There are years and years of happiness before you. If he does not learn your little secret, you are wise. You will turn the money over to me. I can't. I can't. If I were to withdraw a half a million, he'd find out about it. Ah, but there is always the chance that he won't. You do not do as I ask. I shall be forced to reveal the secret. No. No. Yes, Mrs. Morgan. Your husband will learn that while you were in England in 1939, you murdered your... uh, Sweet. I won't listen. I won't listen. But your husband will. And he will learn that after you committed this murder, you spent the following eight years in an English insane asylum. No, no, you can't tell him, you can't. Think of what a sensation the tabloids will make out of it. And think of what people will say. No. Your husband would have to divorce you. Fainted, have you? (laughs) That is not going to help you, Mrs. Morgan. Martin, I just got your message at the theater. Where's Joan? What's wrong? She's in her bedroom with Dr. Richards. It seems that she... Here's Dr. Richards now. Doctor... What's wrong? Keith, you must prepare yourself for a shock. What's happened? A half hour ago, one of your neighbors on the floor heard Joan weeping and screaming hysterically. The manager knew I was your doctor and sent for me. But but why was she weeping and screaming? She's had a breakdown. Uh, Breakdown? Yes. Well, I want to see her. I must. Very well, Keith, but only for a moment. Mr. Walker, I'm afraid you'll have to wait here. I understand, Doctor. Uh, Keith, you must keep a grip on yourself. All right. Joan. <laughs> Darling. It's Keith. Please, stay away from me. Stay away, both of you. No, don't come near me. Doctor, you, she doesn't even recognize me. Yes, Keith, I know. I know who you are. You can't fool me. One of you is Mr. Benedict. Maybe both of you are Mr. Benedict. Yes. I know what you're here for, but I won't let you. I won't let you. She's completely out of her mind. I know you're both Mr. Benedict. You can't fool me. Who is this Benedict she keeps talking about? I don't know, Keith. She she feels she's being persecuted by this Benedict fellow. He may be real, and again, he may be a figment of her imagination. She's definitely afraid of us. Yes, she sees everyone as this fellow Benedict. I tried to give her a sedative, but she, she grows violent when I approach. Well, can't, can't you do something for her? I've already sent for an ambulance. She'd be much better off in a hospital where she can have constant medical care. Come along, Keith. How is she, Doctor? Well, it may be a long time before she recovers. I'm going down to the lobby, wait for the ambulance. I suggest you two stay here, keep an eye on her. I've left the door where room open. All right, Doctor. Shouldn't be more than a few minutes. How do you feel, Keith? (sighs) 
tired, if you want to know. Well, it's only natural. These past two months have been quite strenuous for you. But with a half million dollars and a wife who'll probably never be in any condition to ask you about it, you've done quite well. Quite well? That's an understatement. Name one actor, living or dead, who could have given as great a performance of Mr. Benedict as I did. You were superb as Benedict, I admit. Superb? Why, I was magnificent. The costume, the makeup, my accent, simply perfect. I tell you, it was greatest performance ever given. What a pity you weren't here at 5.30 this afternoon. I'm sure I missed the performance of the age. I outdid myself. You should have heard me. Yes, Mrs. Morgan. Your husband will learn that while you were in England in 1939, you murdered your, uh, sweetheart. That after you committed this murder, you spent the following eight years in an English insane asylum. Ah, it's really a pity I've played my greatest role to an audience of one. Well, yes, Keith, but you were probably the highest paid actor in the world. I'm sure that a half million dollars for two months' work, less my share, of course... Is something of a record. <laughs> yes, it probably is. I hurt you, Mr. Benedict. Uh, oh. You can't fool me. John! I know one of you is Mr. Benedict. Or are you both Mr. Benedict? Yes, you both must be Mr. Benedict. That's clever. Said that disguise you use, that's clever. But you can't fool me. She must have overheard you. That brought her out of her room. Yes, no matter how many disguises you use, I know you. No, 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 don't you come near me. Don't come near me. Keith, she's going to come. Come near John, me. Put that gun down. I'm not going to let you tell. I'm not going to let no, you No, don't. Don't, John. Shut <laughs> You. You shot me. <laughs> oh, John, no. I'm not Mr. Benedict. He's... <laughs> <laughs> You'll never tell Keith now. Never, never, never. <laughs> This is the mysterious traveler again. Did you enjoy our trip? Too bad about poor Keith and Martin. Such interesting scoundrels. That fellow Keith was certainly a remarkable actor, wasn't he? But uh, like so many actors, he overplayed his role. Uh, with fatal results. What happened to Joan Morgan? Well, the poor woman was committed to an institution where after several years of treatment, she recovered completely. However, she still has a deathly fear of actors. Oh, you'll have to get off here. I'm sorry. But I'm sure we'll meet again. I take this same train every week at the same time. You've just heard The Mysterious Traveler, a series of dramas of the strange and terrifying. The role of The Mysterious Traveler is played by Maurice Tarplin. Others in the cast were Santos Ortega, Ann Shepard, and Roger DeCoven. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Mutual Broadcasting System presents The Mysterious Traveler. Written, produced, and directed by Robert A. Arthur and David Coker. And featuring tonight two of radio's most distinguished personalities, Santos Ortega and Richard Coker, in No Grave Can Hold Me. This is The Mysterious Traveler, inviting you to join me on another journey into the realm of the strange and the terrifying. I hope you will enjoy the trip. 
And it will thrill you a little and chill you a little as we travel tonight into the world of shadows from which no man may return. And we learn the story of one who does return. It's a story I call No Grave Can Hold Me. My story starts in a court of law where a man is on trial for his life. The courtroom is tense, for the jury is out deciding the prisoner's fate. But the prisoner himself, a tall man with glossy black hair and piercing eyes, sits calmly with his lawyer, his daughter, Nora, and his son-in-law, Harry Wilson, waiting for the fateful verdict. Oh, dear, I wish we Father, I think the jury is coming in now. They say it's a bad sign when the jury is out for such a short while. You need not worry, either of you. I shall be free. I certainly hope so, Randolph, but... Well, you know, you did admit you killed Clemens. Because he insulted me. He called me a mountebank, a charlatan, a trickster. He called the great Randolph a faker. So he died. There they come. Oh, Father, I'm frightened. They're taking new places in the jury box now. They look awfully grim. I repeat, have no fear for me. Foreman of the jury, has the jury reached a verdict? It has, Your Honor. What is the verdict? We find the defendant guilty as charged of murder in the first degree. Oh, no, no. Who finds you guilty? The fools. They, too, think that I'm an imposter, a trickster. They shall learn different. If I die, so shall they. The prisoner will rise. Father, you stand up. The prisoner will rise. Very well. I'll stand up. So that they will recognize my face again when they see it suddenly in the night. And to know that death has come to claim them. Maximilian Randolph, you have been found guilty of the crime of murder in the first degree. It is the sentence of this court that you shall suffer the punishment of death on the night of June 6th at midnight. And may God have mercy on your soul. Thank you, Guard Miller. You can see him for only five minutes, Mr. Wilson. Yes, all right, Guard. Hello, Randolph. Good evening, Harry. I see that my Guard Miller managed to get you in to see me. Yes, he did. Time is so short that... Well, I know. It is almost midnight. And at midnight, I die. But Guard Miller has become a good friend. I knew he'd arrange it. Nora and I saw the governor this afternoon. He he refused to do a thing. It does not matter. What is death but a new garment for the soul to wear? Nora's waiting outside. You said you didn't want to see her tonight. That is as I wished. You were my assistant. We were very close, you and I. And now there is a last promise. You must make to me. Anything, Randolph. When you receive my body, the empty husk of the great Randolph, bury it in a vault with a bronze door which faces east. A vault facing east? Yes, of course. The door must be locked with a padlock of bronze, but it must be possible to open it from the inside but without Randolph. using a key. Randolph, you... The coffin must be locked shut as well. But I must be able to open it from the inside. Randolph, sure you're not serious. I never joke. All this and one thing more. Promise. All right, I... I promise. When I am buried, 
Beneath my head must rest a notebook bearing the names and addresses of the 12 jurymen who found me guilty, of the prosecuting attorney, and of the judge. But, but why, Randolph? So that I may know where to seek my vengeance upon them. The vengeance I have sworn, which must be executed before my soul can sleep. Oh, Randolph, that's madness. You disbelieve. So do they. But in my studies, I have learned many things. And one of them is how to reach back from behind the dark curtain of death. All right, time is up, sir. Thank you, Miller. Goodbye, Harry. Just tell me one more thing. Is the full moon shining tonight? Yes. It's a full moon tonight. Good. And each time hereafter that it shines, one of my enemies will join me in death. And so the great Randolph went to his execution and was buried according to his instructions. After a few days, his case was forgotten. Uh, forgotten by all but Harry Wilson, his son-in-law. Well, as the first month passed and the full moon again shone in the windows of his apartment, a strange restlessness possessed Harry. Harry, what's wrong with you? No, I, I'm sorry, Nora, but tonight, the night of the full moon, I'm, I'm nervous. I, I can't help it. Oh, darling, you're not worrying about father, are you? About his threat? Yes, I am. Oh, but that's absurd. Poor father. Toward the end, I'm afraid he was suffering from delusions and he was more than just an ordinary man. He wasn't entirely sane. No, maybe not, but he was so sure of himself, so certain. And those instructions for the way he was to be buried. Oh, of course, I, I'm just being foolish. Why don't you go out and walk for a while, Harry? It'll help calm you. All right, all right, I will. You want to come along? It's a nice night. No, I think I'll stay here and read. All right, I'll be back in an hour or so, dear. And if nothing happens tonight, I'll... I'll know that Randolph is just putting on an act. A little later, another man was also walking in the moonlight of a beautiful July evening. This one was short and stout. He was strolling homeward from a small poker party with his friends when in the dark shadows cast by the trees along the edge of the park, a tall figure stepped directly into his path. Just a moment, Adam. Uh, who are you? What do you want? Just to talk to you. Well, I don't want to talk to you. Get out of my Not way. so fast, my friend. Look. A gun. Say, what is this, a hold-up? No, Adam. It is not a hold-up. Then why are you threatening me with that gun? Why have you got that scar covering your face? Because my face has changed in the months since I was executed and buried. It's rather frightening now. What are you saying? Who are you, anyway? You're beginning to recognize my voice, aren't you? You know who I am. You just don't want to admit it to yourself. That great Randolph. Whom you, as foreman of the jury, caused to be executed. Oh, no, no, that's not possible. No one could come back from the dead. No ordinary man. But the great Randolph has no, come back. No, I don't believe it. This is a trick of some kind. And is this a trick, Adam? Is it? Is it? Uh, but... Hello. Hello, Nora. Is Harry there? No, he's out for a walk. Who is this? Don't you recognize my voice, Nora? Surely you heard it often enough. Father. Oh, no, it can't be. Strange how skeptical everyone is of me. Even my own daughter. Father, it is you. What do you want? I just want to tell Harry that I have claimed the first victim of my vengeance. Exactly on the stroke of midnight. The same minute when I died. Oh, no, no. And I wanted to warn him. 
that he must do nothing to interfere with my plans. Or if he does, I shall have to add him to my list of victims. <laughs> No, no, are you? Is the telephone here? You, you want to speak to me? Yes, Harry, just a little after 12. He said that he... Yes, he... I, I know. I heard the news. I was in a restaurant having coffee and it came over the radio. Adams, the foreman of the jury, was found strangled in front of his home. Oh, but it's impossible. And yet it was his voice, Harry. Father's voice. Oh, we've got to do something. No, I've got to warn the others on that list. The other jurors, Baldwin, the district attorney, and Judge Dexter. Yes, but he said if you tried to interfere... I know, but that doesn't matter. In the morning, I'm going to District Attorney Baldwin. He'll believe me. He'll have to. Oh, but Mr. Baldwin, you've got to listen to me. You've got to warn the others. You've got to give them protection. Or they'll die, just as Adams did. Winston, I'm a busy man. I have enough on my mind without having to listen to wild-eyed stories like the one you just told oh, me. Oh, but, but it's true. Randolph's instructions about the way he wanted to be buried, the notebook that I put in the coffin with him. Mere theatrical mummery. Adams was the victim of an ordinary street mugging. That's all there is to it. I have to ask you to leave. I have more important things to tend to. <laughs> Mr. Lord, you're a sensible man. You edit the biggest newspaper in this city. If you'll only print what I've told you, the authorities will have to take some action. Well, sir, my job is to print news for our readers, not ghost stories. If I ran your story, I'd be fired tomorrow. Then you don't believe me. I... Tell you what I will do. I'll make a story for the Sunday supplement out. Oh, that won't do any good. If it's in a Sunday supplement, people will just smile at it. When they see it, they'll know it's just a story. And I'm afraid there's no use in talking any further, Wilson. All right, I'll go to other papers. One of them will have to believe me. I don't advise it. You run a shop, don't you, selling tricks and magic apparatus? Yes, yes, that's right. Why? Just this. Newspapers don't believe in giving free publicity, and that's obviously what you're after. Goodbye, Mr. Wilson. I'm very sorry, Mr. Wilson, but Judge Dexter is unable to see you. Oh, but, Miss, did you explain to him what it's about? How important it is? The judge said if you cared to write him a letter, he'd give the matter his consideration. Oh, that's no good. I've got to talk to him. I'm sorry. He's leaving today for his vacation, and he won't be back for a month. Perhaps he'll be able to see you then, but he simply can't see you now. None of them would listen to me, Nora. They either thought I was crazy or that I wanted publicity. They all told me to forget it. They're right, Harry. That's the only thing to do to forget it. But, Nora... Maybe we're wrong. Maybe Adam's death last night was just a coincidence. I'm sure Father had nothing to do with it. Oh, no, no, no. He telephoned you. You heard his voice? Well, I'm not sure now that I did. Maybe it was a dream, Harry. Maybe I just imagined it. So forget the whole thing. Please, Harry, for my sake, forget it. Oh, Harry, darling, it's no good just pacing up and down. Please, sit down and try to relax. I can't, Nora, I can't. Tonight's the second full moon since Randolph was executed. He'll be leaving his grave tonight, and someone else will die. But Harry, the... There ought to be a guard over the vault he's buried in. Oh, no, that wouldn't do any good if he came back to him. That daddy he wouldn't be bothered by a guard. Please, Harry, you've done the best you can. And if it is true, and you go on like this, will you be in danger, too? I don't care. That list, Nora, the names on it were alphabetical. And Adams, the foreman, was the first to die. What are you driving at? The second name on the list is Baldwin, the district attorney. Baldwin. Wouldn't listen to me last time, but tonight he's got to. I'm going to his home now while it's still time. <laughs> Mr. Baldwin, you are in danger tonight. I'm sure of it. Deadly danger. No, you, you mean it, I'm sure, Will. Yes. I, I thought it was some kind of a gag before. Now I can see you fully believe everything you've said. Oh, then you, you will take precautions. At least for tonight. I've been an officer of the law for 30 years. I've been threatened by a lot of convicted murderers. But not one of them has come back to get me yet. But you don't understand. The great Randolph is different. He had powers that, that we know nothing about. Uh, perhaps, perhaps, but I doubt it. Now, Wilson, I appreciate your warning, but I can't take it seriously. Oh, really? Then you, you 
Won't guard yourself. No more than usual. I'll lock the door presently. I'm sure that'll keep out any ghosts who may come this way. Mr. Baldwin, please, it's almost midnight. At least let me stay with you for another hour. I'm sorry, but I'm about ready to turn in. I expect to sleep well, too. Now, you go on home, do the same. Because nobody's going to be harmed tonight by the great Randolph spook. I guarantee it. Oh, no, I... I... Please, I wish you'd let I me I couldn't stay. think of it. Now, you can find your way out yourself, can't you? I'm sure. Yes, of course. All right, Mr. Baldwin, I won't bother you any longer. Good night. Good night, Wilson. Well, he's gone. I'm afraid the poor fellow needs to see a psychiatrist. <laughs> Randolph's ghost. I only hope I never have anything worse to be afraid of. Gonna... Who's there? Who came in just now? Wilson, is that you again? No, my friend. It is not Wilson. Who are you? What the devil's the meaning of this? You don't recognize me, then? How can I? That cloak with the collar pulled up over your face. That is to spare the world a sight that should remain forever hidden within the darkness of a coffin. But my voice... Surely you recognize that. What are you talking about? Now get out at once or I'll call for the police. It would tax their powers to arrest me. They have no authority in the world to which I belong. No. No, it can't be. I see you have recognized me. You should have taken Wilson's warning, Baldwin. Because I'm here. The great Randolph. At your service. Oh, it's impossible. That's been said of so many things, hasn't it? But I think I can convince you. No. no stay away. Help! Help! That won't do you any good. By the time anyone comes, you will have joined me in the world of death. Oh! Oh! Calling all the way down the hall. Nora, where have you been? I just went out to get the morning papers. Why? Why? It's happened again. District Attorney Baldwin has been killed. But how? Exactly the same way Mr. Adams was killed, strangled, just at midnight. Oh, no. And Nora, I think I know the truth now. What do you mean? I don't believe it was your father at all. I think it was I that killed him. I killed them both. No, you've got to do it. There's a full moon tonight. You've got to lock me in this apartment. Oh, but, Harry, you couldn't possibly have killed those two men. I could. I was near the scene at both times, and my my mind, it, it wasn't clear. I don't remember doing it, but don't you see? If, if I'd been hypnotized, I wouldn't remember. But, darling, Father couldn't have hypnotized you into committing murder. It's a law of hypnosis. The, the, the subject won't do anything he knows is wrong. I know, I know that, but I can't be sure. I believe that in those few minutes I was with him, somehow Randolph impressed on my mind orders to carry out his vengeance for him. Oh, darling, I'm sure he didn't. But if you insist, I'll lock you in. All right. Well, I want you to go now. It might not be safe for you to stay with me. All right, Harry. I'll go to a movie. Got to stay locked in until after midnight. Then even if I am hypnotized, I won't be able to do any harm. You do understand, Nora, don't you? Oh, of course, darling. I'm sure you're wrong, but I'll do anything you say. All right, now. Lock me in. And don't you come back until after midnight. Seven. Eight. Nine. Ten. Eleven. Another hour and then I'll know. Or will I? Maybe I'll try to get out and I won't remember it. Or... Telephone. Yes. Hello. Hello, Harry. Randolph. Yes, my boy. I'm glad at least you don't say... No, it's impossible. No. Where are you, Randolph? That 
doesn't matter. I just wanted to warn you. And don't try to interfere with my plans. But, Randolph, I thought... Hello. Hello. He hung up. That proves that I'm not the one. Then in that case... Yes. That's the only possible answer. I know now what the truth is. Oh, we've got to get out of here. The door. Oh, I couldn't break it down with an axe. Oh, there's no fire escape, and it's eight floors down to the street. They have it, the superintendent. I can telephone the superintendent. Tell him I'm lock, locked in, and then you'll come and let me out. Judge Dexter, first... Adams died. Then Baldwin. Their names were the first two on the great Adam uh, Randolph's list. Your name is third. And so you think that tonight I'm scheduled to die, huh? Yes, yes, I'm sure of it. And you say you warned Baldwin last month just before he was murdered? I did. And he laughed at me. But he died just the same. And you're seriously asking me to believe that a dead man, legally executed by the state, is walking the streets tonight seeking my life? I tell you, he telephoned me only half an hour ago. I recognized his voice. <laughs> You know, of course, that your story sounds like the ravings of an insane mind. I know it. That's why I've kept quiet this last month. I did try to convince the police, the district attorney, and all I got was laughed at. And then... Yes, and yet, uh, obviously, you're you're in earnest. I, I don't think you're crazy. I'm not. For a little while, I thought that I was the killer. You? How? I thought I was under post-hypnotic control. That Randolph had planted in my mind the impulse to kill his enemies... But that phone call proved that I was wrong. And what do you propose that we do? If we went to his tomb, perhaps, then we'd learn the truth. Well, Wilson, what do you want to open Randolph's tomb for? Don't you see? If we go there and we find Randolph is still in his coffin, then I'll know that the real murderer is my wife, Nora. I, I have the key right here. I'll have the padlock off in a minute. Well, then hurry. The moon is bright. I'd hate to have anyone see us. Yes, sir. A very strange story. A man in my position prowling around a cemetery at midnight. Oh, but we had to come, Judge. We had to make sure. Well. There. Yeah. Unlocked it. We can open the vault door now. I'm rather sorry I paid any attention to you, Wilson. But we're here now, so let's get this thing over with. Now, I'm going in first. But don't forget, I'm on. Oh, don't worry about me. There, I've shut the door. Be safe to turn on the flashlight now. There. See? There's the coffin. That's odd. Huh? What is it, Judge? The air in here is fresh. This vault has been opened and very recently. Then it must have been opened by Randolph. Oh, nonsense. Open this coffin and I'll prove it. Here. How does it work? This catch on the side. Can be operated either from the inside or out. There we are. It's unlocked. Well, then lift the lid, man. Lift it. What? All right, I'll do it. No. There, there. There you are. Now, see? There's your precious Randolph, safe and sound, just as I expected. Quite dead. As he's supposed to be. He's still in his coffin. Yes, and that proves that he... Wilson. Shine your flashlight down on the floor. I, I just touched a body. Lying here near the wall. Body? Oh, it's Nora. She's dead. I don't think so. Here, give me that light. Jimmy. What happened? Why did you turn out the flashlight? Something knocked it out of my hands. I, I can't find it. Because I have it, Harry. That's why you can't find it. Randolph! Wilson, what are you saying? It's Randolph. He's not dead. Oh, but I am, Harry. But don't let that disturb you. I want to thank you for bringing the judge here to me. Wilson, where are you? You're trying to play a trick on me? No, no, I swear. He's quite innocent, Judge Dexter. And as for Nora, she merely came to make sure I was where I'm supposed to be. Just as you did. When I spoke to her, she fainted. Wilson, get the door open. We've got to have some light in here. It's no use, Dexter. I can see in the dark like a cat, and you can't. No. I have you now. No, Judge. Get out of here. You're going to... Die, Dexter. Executed as you ordered me. 
executed. Randolph, let me go. I warn you, Randolph, I'm... I've got a gun. I'm going to shoot. You're too late. Yeah. Yeah. Are you all right? Yes. Yes, I am. Now, see if you can find the flashlight. I think I've taken care of Mr. Randolph. If it was Randolph... I think I have it. Yes, here it is. Judge, Randolph's body, it's it's still in the coffin. I rather thought it would be. Harry? Harry, is that you? Oh, no. You're not hurt? No, just my head. I I came here to see your father. I understand, Mrs. Wilson. And then someone hit you. Yes, from behind. There was someone here in the vault. I just got a glimpse of him, and then then he hit me. But who was it? That's what we're just about to find out. Now, let me have the flashlight, Wilson. Yes, of course. I think he fell over here. Now, yes, here he is. But who is he? He was impersonating father, but but who is he? I hear he's lying on his face. I'd better turn him over. Carefully now. He's still breathing. That's it. Oh. Hey, it's Miller, the guard from the penitentiary. The one Randolph said he made a friend of. Yes, the one who was guarding him just before he was executed. Oh, so that's it. It was Miller. Miller, can you hear me? I'm afraid he's dying. Before Father was executed, he must have hypnotized this man and ordered him to carry out his fantastic scheme of vengeance. Oh, it was a trick, but it was a very cunning trick. By means of hypnosis, Randolph used this man as a tool, even though Randolph himself was dead. He must have recognized that Miller was unusually susceptible. I think we'll find that Miller was a psychotic to begin with. Otherwise, Randolph's hypnosis would never have worked. For no normal person can be influenced the way Miller was under any circumstances. Isn't there anything we can do for him? No. No, he's gone. And with him, the great Randolph has died, too. For good. Traver again. So the great Randolph is dead for good, is he? I wonder. After all, Miller wasn't the only guard Randolph had a chance to talk to. Oh, but he, he couldn't have hypnotized any of the others. I wouldn't give it another thought if I were you. Unless, of course, you were on the jury that convicted Randolph. In that case... Oh, you have to get off here. I'm sorry. But I'm sure we'll meet again. I take this same train every week at the same time. You have just heard The Mysterious Traveler, a series of dramas of the strange and terrifying. The role of the mysterious travelers played by Maurice Tarplin. In tonight's cast were Santos Ortega, Richard Coogan, Shirley Blank, and Bill Smith. Original music composed and played by Al Finelli. All characters in this story were fictitious, and any resemblance to actual persons was purely coincidental. This is Bob Emmerich speaking. This program came from New York. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. You are listening to Chesterton Radio at ChestertonRadio.com. Mutual presents The Mysterious Traveler. This is The Mysterious Traveler, inviting you to join me on another journey into the realm of the strange and the terrifying. I hope you will enjoy the trip, that it will thrill you a little and uh, chill you a little. So settle back and get a good grip on your nerves, if you can. Where are we going? Well, let us say for the moment, we're taking a little trip into time. And a story I call... New Year's Nightmare. (laughs) 
As the old year entered its last minute, the crowds at the Club Tropicana were waiting expectantly for the clock to strike midnight. At a ringside table, a lovely young woman angrily whispers to the man with her. Chris, if you take another drink, I'll leave. Oh, Judy, this is New Year's Eve. It'll be 1947 in another minute. Gotta celebrate, don't I? Just one more. Just one more, just one more. That's what you always say. I wouldn't mind if it were just tonight, but you're always getting drunk. Waiter, another bottle of champagne. Nothing I say means anything to you, does it? Do you think because I've forgiven you a dozen times in the past, I'll do it again? But you're wrong, Chris. Happy New Year, darling. 1947 is going to be our year. No, Chris, it isn't. I won't marry a man who gets drunk in New York and wakes up the next day in another city. Oh, Judy, what are you saying? You don't mean that. You know I love you. Yes, Chris, you love me. But not enough to give up drinking. I'll miss you, Chris. I miss you terribly. But I know I'm doing the right thing. Judy, don't talk like that. I couldn't live without you. You know that. Won't you? I'm sorry, Chris. Here's your ring. Will you please take me home? You don't have to leave. If the sight of my drinking is too much for you, I'll go someplace else and do it. Martin will take you home. Happy New Year and goodbye. <laughs> Finishing that drink, mister. It's five o'clock in the morning and I'm dead on my feet. Sure. Sure, I'll drink up. No matter what she says. That's right. Now you better go home and sleep it off. Good night and a happy 1947 to you. Thanks. And the same to you. Don't. Gotta find another bar. New Year's. Got to celebrate. Hmm. Another bar across the street. Oh, got to celebrate. Hey, mister, look out for that car. You want to get run down, Mr. Bob? Look out! that noise? Those horns? Well, darling, it's midnight. New Year's. Oh, my head is throbbing so. Where am I? How did I get here? Why, darling, you live here. Live here? What are you talking about? Charles, I'd better call Dr. Smith. You look so strange. Hello? Connect me with Dr. Smith's apartment, please. Never seen this place before. Hello, Doctor. This is Blanche Arnold. Yes, it's Charles. He isn't well. Could you come to our apartment at once? Oh, thank you. Goodbye. What do you mean, I live here? Who are you? Where am I? I'm your wife, Charles. This is our home, don't you remember? You're my wife. You can't be. I'm not married. What am I doing here? What's your game? Charles, can't you remember anything about us? What are you talking about? I never saw you before. And why do you keep calling me Charles? My name is Chris. Chris Andrews. Chris Andrews. So that's what the initial C.A. stood for. Oh, that noise out there. What are they making such a racket for? Because it's midnight, New Year's Eve. Midnight? New Year's Eve? But it was midnight hours ago, when I left the Club Tropicana. What are you talking about? Oh, that must be Dr. Smith. I'll answer it. Dr. Smith? I don't know any Dr. Smith. Oh, come in, Doctor. I'm so glad you're here. I think it's the amnesia. It seems to have left him all of a sudden. Charles? It's Dr. Smith. I don't know him, and I don't know you. And please stop calling me Charles. I told you my name is Chris Andrews. Mm-hmm. Uh, won't you sit down, Mr. Andrews? I'd like to talk with you for a few minutes. What about? 
Uh, tell me, Mr. Andrews, what's the last thing you remember before finding yourself in this apartment? Why, Judy. She and I were at the Club Tropicana, celebrating New Year's Eve. I see. I remember we quarreled about my drinking. I walked out on her and had a few drinks someplace else. Uh -huh. That's all I can recall. Oh, my head. I've had hangovers, but I've never thought like this before. What time is it? Uh, it's just four minutes after 12. But it can't be four minutes after 12 New Year's Eve. That was hours ago when I left the Tropicana. Mr. Andrews, that was New Year's Eve, 1947. What do you mean, that was New Year's Eve, 1947? Uh, this is New Year's Eve, 1948. 1948? What are you talking about? It's 1947. Well, here's the morning paper. You can see the date for yourself. Thursday, January 1st. 1948. No, it can't be. It can't be. A year gone? Just like that? But where did it go? I haven't lived it yet. Perhaps you'd better let me clear up a few things for you. 1948? Uh, my name is Smith. I was a resident physician until recently at the Park Hospital. Uh, while I was on duty uh, last New Year's Day, 1947... You were brought into the hospital seriously injured, having been run over by a car. When you recovered consciousness five days later, you didn't know who you were. You were a victim of amnesia. Amnesia? Yes, and we didn't know who you were as you had no identification papers. But my wallet of uh, letters... They were gone. The only clue to your identity was a belt buckle with the initials uh, C.A. on it. We didn't know your real name, so I called you Charles for the sea. Uh, Blanche was your nurse. I've always liked the name Charles. And as for your last name, we thought Arnold was as good as any, so you became Charles Arnold. But what have I been doing since the day I recovered consciousness? Well, you weren't discharged from the hospital until May. Uh, then you went to work as an insurance clerk. As an insurance clerk? But I don't know anything about being a clerk. I'm a reporter. Well, there was no way of learning what your occupation had been. Uh, so when Blanche learned of this opening in an insurance office, you applied for the position. And that's where I've been working? Up to now? Yes. And then after you got your job, we were married. Married? Charles. I mean, Chris. Don't you remember? I'm afraid, Blanche, you really can't. Married. But Judy... Oh, it's like a dream. My head keeps throbbing. I keep expecting to wake up. There's a date in the paper. January 1st, 1948. Doctor, you said he might never get over his amnesia. Well, that was a strong possibility, but apparently the sounds of New Year's brought back his memory. You're going just like that. Judy, my friends, job, all gone. Doctor, where am I? I mean, what's the address of this apartment house? You're at 5718 North 13th Street, Philadelphia. Philadelphia? But how did I get to Philadelphia? Uh, that we don't know. All that I can tell you is that your accident occurred just a few blocks from here. Darling, I know what a shock it must be. Strange. Have. You must have called me darling many times in the past. And yet this is the first time I've, I've ever heard you call me that. Yes. I know. What did you say your name was? Oh, hello, Doctor. Come in, won't you? Thank you. How are you, Blanche? Mm, all right, I suppose. How's Chris getting along? He's fine. It's just... Why, Blanche, what's this? I've never seen you cry. Here, here. No, it's just that everything's so changed. Those six months Chris and I were married before he regained his memory were the happiest of my life. And now? This past month since he got his memory back, it's been as though I were married to a stranger. It isn't as though he doesn't try to be nice to me. 
But it's all so obvious. He doesn't love me. Now, Blanche, you mustn't say that. It's true, I tell you. How can a man love a woman those first six months as he loved me and then fall out of love with her when he's regained his memory? Well, you must have patience, Blanche. It will take time for Chris to adjust himself to what's happened. He fell in love with you as Charles Arnold, and I'm sure he will as Chris Andrews. You just must give him time. <laughs> Just let me look at you. This can't be true. You're being here. Oh, well, it is. Uh, it's been a long time. Yes. A year and a month since New Year's Eve, 1947. Chris, what are you doing here in Philadelphia? I live here. Well, so do I. I got a job with Ryan and Company as a copywriter here a few months ago. Look, Judy, we can't talk here on the sidewalk. <laughs> that's right. Uh, well, look, I, I live only a few blocks from here. We can go to my apartment. Oh, that's fine. There's so much I want to ask, and there's so much to tell. Here, let me have your hat and coat. Thank you. Would you like something to drink? No, I uh, don't drink anymore. Oh? Chris, you have changed. You look so much older. Well, you don't. You're as lovely as that night I saw you last. Thank you, Chris. Judy, you'll have to let me explain what happened after I left you that night at the Tropicana. If you find it difficult to believe, I won't blame you. It still seems like a nightmare to me. That night, after I left you... And so now you know everything. From the moment I... Last saw you to this one. Oh, no wonder you look different after having gone through an experience like that. Well, you're all right now. You, you know who you are. You're happily married. You have a job. I'm not happily married, Judy. Chris, you mustn't talk like that. Surely you must have loved your wife if you married her. And she hasn't changed. Judy, there's never been anyone for me but you. You know that. And you still feel that way about me. No, I don't. When we met tonight, that... An old look was still in your eyes. You do care. You know you do. Please, Chris, no matter how I feel about you, it's over now. You're married, and that's all there is to it. I, I, I wish you'd go, and I don't want to see you again. Chris, where have you been? I expected you home from work hours ago. I met a friend. Oh. Oh, you look so tired. Do you feel well? Blanche, this past month I tried my best to be a good husband, haven't I? Oh, you have been, darling. No, there's something missing, and you know it. Oh, it isn't your fault. It's mine. And as a result, we're both unhappy. You mustn't say that, Chris. I feel that in time, things will be as they were when we were first married. When you were Charles Arnold. No, but they won't be, Blanche. It's no use, I tell you. Chris, who is the friend you met tonight? The girl I was once engaged to. I see. Blanche, you've got to give me a divorce. No, Chris. I'll never do that. But why? You know I don't love you. What's the sense in going on like this? Chris, when you were Charles Arnold... You did love me, and we were happy together. I had your love once, and I mean to win it back. I won't give you a divorce. Hello, Judy. Chris. Chris, I, I asked you not to call on me again. Judy, I've got to talk to you. May I come in? Well, all right. But just for a few minutes. Thank you. Judy, even if we hadn't met again a week ago, things wouldn't have been any different between my wife and myself. I'll never love her. And I'm not going on with her. 
What do you mean, Chris? I'm going to leave her, Judy, and start all over someplace far away. I just came around to say goodbye. Are you set on leaving her? Yes. Nothing can change my mind about that. Now, you, you've got to understand my position, Chris. I could never be happy with you if I thought I'd been the one who came between you and your wife. But if you are going to leave her, I would like to see you again when you're free. Would you, Judy? Yes. But I don't want to see you until she's given you a divorce. A divorce? Judy, I am going to be free. Nothing's going to prevent it. Nothing. <laughs> Uh, how would you like to go out tonight? Go out? Yeah, we might take in a show or go dancing. <laughs> Didn't I ever take you out when I was Charles Arnold? Oh, why, yes. We used to have wonderful evenings together then. Well, why not now? Unless you don't want to. Oh, Chris, there's nothing in the world I'd rather do. Hey, why the tears? Oh, it's just a... I'm so happy. Oh, come here. <laughs> Oh, uh, did this Mr. Arnold ever put his <laughs> arms around you like this? Oh, yes, often. <laughs> oh, Chris, stop squeezing me so tight. Chris! Sorry, darling. Oh. Oh. You almost, you almost squeezed me to death. That's so you remember that I'm your husband and uh, not Mr. Arnold. And uh, Blanche. Oh, yes, Chris. I'm taking a week's vacation soon, um... Uh, what do you say if we go up to the Adirondack Mountains for a week of winter sports? Oh, Chris, I'd love to. Well, it'll be like a second honeymoon. Blanche, you all right? There's only a few more feet to the top. I'm coming, darling. from here, isn't it? You're right. Being up here is like being alone in the world. Yes, just the two of us. Oh, this past week's been a wonderful one, Chris. I've never been so happy. Nor have I. Oh, be careful, Chris. Don't go so near the edge. That canyon's 4,000 feet deep. Oh, this ledge is perfectly safe. Come over here and take a look at the valley below. All right. Oh, please keep your arms around me, Chris. Looking down like this frightens me. There. You're safe in my uh, arms. Chris, why are you looking at me that way? What way, dear? I don't know. Is your head throbbing again? No, dear. Uh, I don't suppose you've changed your mind about giving me a divorce, have you? Giving you a divorce? But I thought we were so happy together. Yes, that's the impression I meant people to get. Chris, you can't be serious. Why, everything's been wonderful these past few weeks. Oh, I see it won't be any use trying to talk you into it. What do you mean? I'm sorry, Blanche. I don't want to do this, but you've given me no alternative. It's really your own fault uh, that you must die. Let, let, let go of me. Let, let, it, let, no, no, you're no. struggling, darling. No one can see or hear you. And you can't possibly escape. You can't throw me off that ledge. Then I'll hang you. I don't think so, dear. No. We've been so happy these past few weeks. I'm sure the police will see it as an unfortunate no, accident. Stop pushing me toward the edge. Chris, don't know. I'll give you a divorce. I'll give you anything. Chris, I'm don't afraid it's too late right for that. Uh, good evening, Judy. Uh, may I come in? Why, yes, of course. How are you, Chris? Oh, I'm all right. I uh, want to thank you for the note you sent me uh, when Blanche died. I can't tell you how sorry I was to hear about it, Chris. Yes, it, it all happened so quickly. 
What have you been doing since then? Oh, just working. Trying to straighten myself out. Mm -hmm. Judy, perhaps I shouldn't talk about it now, seeing that Blanche has only been gone a month, but I've been thinking of leaving town. Will you come with me? Please sit down, Chris. You make me nervous walking back and forth like this. All right. You haven't answered my question. Well, it isn't easy to answer. Oh, it would be if you said yes. Uh, I see in your eyes you mean no. Why? Chris, I've met someone else recently. Someone else? But you said if I were free, you'd marry me. I didn't say I'd marry you. I said if you were free, I'd like to see you again. But now I'm not even sure of that. You're so different from what you used to be. Stop being clever. If you didn't say you'd marry me, you, you implied as much. Please, Chris, you're, you're, you're making it so difficult for me. I'm making it difficult for you. And I suppose what I've been through doesn't count. I risked my life to get you. you risked your life? Chris, what are you saying? Are you such a fool as to believe that Blanche fell off that mountain? Didn't yes. It? And I did it because you said you'd marry me if I were free. Oh, no. I meant a divorce. But she wouldn't give me a divorce. It was the only way I could gain my freedom. And now you tell me there's someone else. Oh, Chris. I did it for you. And you're going to marry me. No, I won't. If I can't have you, no one else will. Chris, what's the matter with you? Chris! We were meant for each other, darling. In life and in death. Chris, if you come any closer, I'll scream for help. No, don't. Chris, no! You won't marry me. You'll never marry no. Anyone else? There. He'll never have you. Open up the door. Miss Winters, are you all right? Call the police. Oh, I didn't want to do it, darling. But you forced me to. Oh, my head. It throbs so. Everything's like a nightmare. Open up the door. This is the police. The police? I've got to get away. Oh, they're closing in on me. There's no escape from this roof. Let's work our way down from this end of the roof to the other. They'll never take me alive. Never. I've got five bullets. Four for them and the last for myself. Maybe it's not job. mind telling me your name? There weren't any identification papers in your clothing, and we'd like to inform your relatives of what's happened. My name? It's... It's... I can't remember my name. I see. Well, what about your address? Can you remember that? No. No, I can't remember anything. Now, you mustn't get excited. It'll all come back to you. You received a fractured skull from the accident. There was a mountain. Mountain? You, you mean you live near one? I... I don't know. There was a mountain. And the police were chasing me. And I... Jumped off a high building. It... It's all mixed up. You probably dreamed that uh, while you were unconscious. But you're all right now. 
Just need rest and quiet. Where am I? You're in the Park Hospital, Philadelphia. Philadelphia? What day is it? It's January 5th, 1947. It's 7.26 in the evening. And you don't know my name? No, all we have is your belt buckle with the initials uh, C.A. C.A.? Nurse, will you look after the patient now? I'll be in to see him later tonight. Yes, doctor. Are you comfortable? The initial C.A. What do you suppose they stand for? Perhaps the C is for Charles. Charles? Charles. I don't know. Well, suppose I call you Charles. Just for the time being. I always liked the name Charles. All right. What's your name? I'm Miss Thompson, but you can call me Blanche. And Charles, let me be the first to wish you a happy 1947. This is the mysterious traveler again. Have you enjoyed our little trip? Oh, by the way, I want to wish you all a very happy new year. And I do hope you'll be careful about making new acquaintances. And perhaps you'd better keep an eye on the old ones, too. For after all, who can foretell the future? Not even Chris Andrews, or should I say Charles Arnold, knows what's in store for him. But we do, don't we? And uh, speaking of the future, I... Oh, you're getting off here. I'm sorry. But I'm sure we'll meet again. I take this same train every week at this same time. You've just heard The Mysterious Traveler, a series of dramas of the strange and terrifying. In tonight's cast were Maurice Toplin, Stuart Brody, Louise Fitch, Hester Sondergaard, and Mort Lawrence. Original music was played by Doc Whipple. The Mysterious Traveler is written and directed by Bob Arthur and David Cogan. Listen next week over most of these stations to a tale titled... No Grave Can Hold Me. Another tale of The Mysterious Traveler. Mysterious Traveler has been presented from our New York studios. Carl Caruso speaking. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. This is Chesterton Radio, your home for podcasts of works by G.K. Chesterton, plus drama, comedy, mystery, science fiction, big bands, and much more. The soundtrack to your Chesterton Day at Chesterton there are Radio. People in most com. countries who would like to live in the Republic of the United States or the Dominion of Canada where that good Olga Cole is so. The citizens of our free countries are the envy of many people elsewhere because of the personal freedom which we have enjoyed. Why then doesn't every country adopt a form of free government? One answer is that unfortunately there are people and parties in many nations who are so greedy for power that they will sacrifice the freedom of their fellow countrymen to obtain power for themselves. History, even recent history, is replete with such instances. That is why the citizens of the Republic of the United States and the Dominion of Canada must be careful to recognize at its very beginning any movement to steal or limit their freedom. That is not always easy. The man who would enslave a free people doesn't begin by saying, Now I'm going to be your dictator. Instead, he probably will claim that he is a devoted supporter of personal freedom. But all the while, he will support policies that weaken and undermine personal freedom. Such a man will deny any totalitarian aims. But free citizens must not be deceived by such denials. Apparently, it is a cardinal principle of every sincere totalitarian that he is justified in lying, if such lies will advance his plans. In these times, no public figure... And no party or organization supporting such a person can be accepted without careful consideration. Every public figure and organization must be carefully scrutinized. And if their real aims are to limit or to destroy our freedom as individuals, 
They must be opposed. This is Chesterton Radio, the true, good, and beautiful at ChestertonRadio.com. <laughs>